Welcome to the September 3rd, 2024 meeting. Please silence your cell phones, pagers, or other electronic communication devices. Agendas and speaker request forms are located at the back of the chambers. The commission utilizes speaker request forms. If you'd like to speak on an item, please complete a speaker request form, locate the bookshelf in the back of the chambers, and return it to the commission clerk, Gerilyn Sistick, located at the lower left side of the dais. At this time, we'll call the meeting to order, and I'd ask uh, Commissioner Roskinick to the moment of silence, and followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Commissioner. Next is the review and, and approval of the agenda. Hello. Moved by Hadcock. Second. Seconded by Drews. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next is recognition of the new employees. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all the employees that made it down here, and I believe we have pretty close to 30. And Thank you. I, uh, from talking to a few of you, few of you had moved from one department to another and, and are moving up in your career, and that's what Pennington County is about. And I just really want to appreciate you choosing uh, Pennington County for your career. Is there any other comments from the commissioners? Uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ross. I just want to, yeah, it was fun talking to some of you folks. Some of you uh, aren't from South Dakota, and you're, you come from places a lot warmer than here, so good luck with this winter, and uh, welcome to Pennington County and uh, our happy family. Chair. Ms. Hadcock. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining our team here at Pennington County. One thing I liked, and I'll be up straight, we hired a lot of women that I met in the audience today in their uh, jail and different areas, and I appreciate that. Um, adds to our team, adds to the diversity in which we have in the jail, which I like. Most of them were from the jail. Some were from uh, the HR department and other places, but I uh, appreciate you all coming to our team, and uh, hopefully uh, you love it here at Pennington County as much as we do. So thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Seeing none, thank you, and time to get back to work. No. <laughs> we'll move on. Uh, next on our agenda is the consent agenda, and this is, I'll recognize uh, Commission Coordinator Joan Martin. Good morning, Commissioners. The Board of Commissioners <clears throat> uses a consent agenda to act on non-controversial and routine items. The consent agenda is acted upon by one motion and vote of the Board. Items may be removed them from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda at the request of a board member or a citizen. The consent agenda contains the following items. Item A, meetings from the regular meeting, August 20th, 2024. Item B, approval of the vouchers in the amount of $243,290.20 as submitted by the auditor's office. And item C, authorizing buildings and grounds to purchase one 2024 Ford Transit from TransWest of Sioux Falls, located at 2101 East Benson Road in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, utilizing state contract number 17616 in the amount of $56,875 as submitted by buildings and grounds. Thank you, Joan. At this time, are there any members of the public who wish to remove any items from the consent agenda? None. Is there any commissioners that would like to have any items removed from the consent agenda? Seeing none, I'd look for a motion for the consent agenda. Chair, sure, I'd move approval. Second. Moved by Drew, seconded by Rosknecht to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion? There are none. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Now we come to regular agenda items. And it's the Penton County Board of Mental Illness Appointments. Uh, we do have, I'm going to attempt these names, Greg Barnier as chair. Is he here? 
Greg? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, glad to be here. You uh, have in your packet the recommendation for appointment for three individuals. Uh, just as background, uh, those three, in we had more applications than that, but those three individuals each have some prior either work experience or other type of connection in working with uh, those who struggle with symptoms of mental illness. And so they're recommended for appointment for a three-year term to the board. And both Ms. Martin and uh, Jay Alderman were uh, helpful in moving this process forward. So, um, we Could you just speak into the mic, Greg, a little bit? Into the mic. I'm sorry. <laughs> there I, you go. I apologize. So we, I had help in moving this forward, both from Joan as well as from Jay Alderman. And if there's, if you have questions, I'm glad to respond. But I think it's fair to say it's a pretty um, straightforward matter. Mr. Chair. Mr. Drews. So, Greg, uh, the good news about it is I'm, I'm glad you had a, a number of applicants for it. We, we did. We had, uh, it was just for reasons I don't understand, this was just um, a better time and we had applicants and so we're able to move forward now. That's excellent because this is a critical board to us and we appreciate your service for the many years that you've done this also, but appreciate the board members willing to step up and take on this challenge. So thank you. Chair. I'll convey that. You done? Ms. Hacka. Well, I've known you for a while, uh, Mr. Bernier, and your work experience and your connection to this has been positive for Pennington County, and you've been with us a long time. So uh, looks like the new recruits that uh, you have for your board have that work experience and connection that will make your job become maybe not easier, but be able to relate in, and uh, move it forward in a positive way. So thanks for everything you do because uh, mental illness and some of the areas that you have to deal with are, are pretty hard. And if you don't have that experience, um, moving that forward and finding those connections for the people, not only yourselves, is, is huge for uh, making people's lives better. So thank you for all you've done for us, sir. Thank you, Commissioner. Any further comments? I'd, look, I'd look for a motion. Uh, Chair. Move approval. Mr. Mr. I'd move to appoint Tracy Decker, Lois Westerwald, and Julia Kelly to the Pennington County Board of Mental Illness for a term of three years, <coughs> effective 2024 through 2027. Second. second from, moved by Drew, second by Hancock. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Greg. Next, that brings us up to items from emergency management, and I'll recognize uh, Director Dustin Willett. Good morning, Commission. Dustin Willett, Pennington County Emergency Manager. Um, before you is our uh, local emergency management performance grant uh, documentation for 2025, for federal fiscal year 2025. So this is the primary uh, federal grant that funds our office uh, in, in conjunction with, uh, obviously, uh, funds from the county, funds from the city, and this is the, the third leg of our funding stool. Um, the reason it's, it uh, uh, comes before you on the regular agenda is every year uh, there are tweaks to the requirements. So this document has all the things that we are required to do as emergency management in order to remain eligible for that funding. Um, and just because those items don't necessarily remain static, uh, we don't think it's necessarily appropriate to put it on the consent agenda, even though this comes before you every single year at this at this time of the year. So uh, this is 2025's agreement. In terms of things that have changed, um, uh, they're really minimal in terms of requirements. So some of the types of exercises that we're required to do, the, the types have changed. Um, uh, we used to have to go to a particular class and now we don't have to go to that particular class. So there, there are tiny little uh, uh, changes in the agreement. It really doesn't affect uh, the, the amount of work and, and the, uh, the, the time that our staff spends on these requirements. So uh, it's the, the changes are, are relatively inconsequential to, to our work and our staffing. Uh, it's the, the things that we do every single year. Um, and so I'm happy to stand for any questions. But uh, the request is, is to have the, the, uh, the chair affix our signature to the uh, 2025 LEMPG agreement for emergency management. Chair. 
Thanks, Dustin. Ms. Hancock. Move to approve the 2025 Local Emergency Management Performance Grants LEMPG subrecipient agreement. Moved by Hancock. Second. Seconded by Lassiter. Any further discussion? Hear none. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank Thanks you, Commissioner. <clears throat> Next, this brings us up to items from the Highway Department, and I'll recognize Highway Superintendent Joe Miller. Good morning, Commission. Joe Miller, Pennington County Highway Superintendent. Uh, item A up in front of you is an idea that came to us from uh, LTAP. Mr. Greg Vavra uh, introduced us to this. They've been doing this in North Dakota for several years, it sounds like, and has gained quite a bit of popularity up there. Um, it's essentially a public outreach to allow the public into our highway shop and, and view the vehicles that uh, do our snow removal, maintain our roads, um, all the vehicles that we, we use and have there to, to maintain our county highways. Um, I've also invited the sheriff and uh, search and rescue. They've agreed to, to both bring a vehicle to showcase in this. Um, we chose uh, Wednesday the 18th. That's the end of the county commissioner's convention there. So if any county con commissioners want to stop by there, they'll be able to do so. So with that, I'll stand for any questions. Is there any questions for Joe? One comment, Joe, I think this is probably a good idea to get people, number one, the highway shop is very well organized and neat, so you guys do a good job of being able to do that, number one. And I, I think uh, bringing young children to that event to be able to get them up there gets them interested into the trade industry, and I think that's uh, very, <clears throat> very important. So I appreciate it. I agree, and one thing I did forget to mention, we'll have food trucks there, so you can come enjoy a, an evening of meals or a, a meal from a food truck from one of our local vendors as well. So, Okay. Thanks, Joe. Next one is South School. Your next item, item B. Item B is a, uh, an agreement between us and the South Dakota Department of Transportation. Um, so during the 385 closure, the Mystic uh, traffic count went from about 200 on average for the last about 15 to 20 years to over 600 cars a day during that closure. Um, we had magwatered it pre uh, previously with our magwater policy, um, and that with the dry weather, with the extreme or with the uh, increased number of traffic or vehicles. On the road, the magwater didn't seem to last, as Commissioner Ross Connect can attest to. Um, so we, I approached the DOT, uh, the manager that's running the 385 project, and asked him if there would be any possibility of, of them reimbursing us through that project for a portion of the, the material that we put down on, Mag or, uh, on Mystic Road. And um, he went to his boss, um, and they graciously agreed to supply us with $20,000 towards that uh, reapplication re of Magwater for uh, Mystic Road. So that's where this agreement comes from. Mr. Chair. Mr. Uh, Roskin. So the Mystic Road's never really been totally Magwatered. So back in May, or May and June, that's when it was totally Magwatered and reprepped. And I got to admit, that road was in really good shape. And then two months, and I'd travel that road two to four times a, a week this summer. Uh, I'm glad the uh, state stepping up with the 20,000. I was on it last week, and I told Joe I only did uh, about half of it, but uh, the half that half is done, and it really looks good. And uh, I'm glad that you can, the state decided to participate and jump in because uh, in that two months, we that road really took a beating. Any further discussion? I'll go ahead and make the motion to uh, move to approve the maintenance and financial agreement with South Dakota DOT for reimbursement of the Mystic Road maintenance costs due to the Highway 385 reconstruction project and road closure in the amount of $20,000. Second. Moved by Roskinek, seconded by Drews. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item C. Item C is an agreement, uh, intergovernmental agreement between Rapid Valley Sanitary District and Pennington County uh, for asphalt repairs. So as you all know, Rapid Valley Sanitary Sewer has their water lines and sanitary sewer lines underneath our roads um, all throughout Rapid Valley. 
Over the past couple of years, Rapid Valley has struggled to find a contractor to, to come and complete these small asphalt repairs. So Rusty, a couple of years ago, approached me and asked me if we would be interested in doing those uh, asphalt repairs. I said, if you can't find anybody, yes, we will come do them because we want our roads sealed up before wintertime. Um, so the last couple of years, that's what's been going on. And, and Rusty approached me this spring and said, hey, we should probably get just get an agreement in place for this. So uh, Rusty had his uh, attorney put together the agreement. We kind of went back and forth on a couple items. Um, and this is the final product that you see in front of you. Both their legal and our legal has had eyes on it. Um, it some things to note, this is a cost plus. So it's they're not paying just the, the bare minimum they're paying just like they would pay a contractor so with that i'll stand for any questions Are there any questions for joe on this seeing none i'd look for welcome to the board mr drews i'd move to approve the intergovernmental agreement with rapid valley sanitary district for asphalt repairs moved by drews take it seconded by <coughs> ambassador any further discussion Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item D. Item D is authorization to advertise and let an overhead crane project. Uh, so when our building was originally built in 2017, um, there was a crane in the welding bay, um, but they had moved that crane from the welding bay to the main shop because that's where they thought it would most be utilized. Well, with doing that, um, all of our fabrication went from the welding where all the, the, eva the gas evacuation apparatuses are um, and the, uh, I'm forgetting the terminology for it, but um, they do a lot of their, most of their fabrication on the, on the other side of the wall there where it's just basic repairs were meant to be. Um, so we put in our budget the last couple of years to, to uh, put this crane up. We found a crane uh, dealer, figured, okay, maybe we can just do this ourselves, but the more you get into it, we ended up hiring upper deck uh, architecture to do an engineering design um, and go through, basically build a set of plans so we can go out to bid for this because it's going to be over $100,000, um, so it will be required to be bid by South Dakota state statute. So what this will do is it'll open up that bay in our main shop for repairs and streamline the fabrications. They'll be able to park a truck over there and not have to move it in and out um, as needed throughout the year. So with that, I'll stand for any questions. Any questions for Joe? I go back to the commission for a motion. Sure. Mr. Drews. I move to authorize the highway department to advertise and let an overhead crane project. Second. Moved by Drew, seconded by Roskinect. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next, we come up to emergency procurement. Item E. Um, so last, I believe it was Wednesday, August, oh, it was, a couple, was it last Wednesday? Two, two Wednesdays ago already. It's kind of all a blur since this happened. August 21st, um, we believe uh, a lightning strike struck either the building or the loader. Um, the fire marshal has been out and is conducting an investigation that's not complete quite yet. Um, but it burned the a loader completely to the ground along with a pickup. Um, severely scorched another pickup, as you can see in your, your packet there, that we believe will be a total loss as well. Um, and then melted a, a, a tractor um, and then did significant damage to the, the wall shop. So. Um, with that, that's the reason Davis is up here. Um, he can talk a little bit about the, the damage to the shop and, and what our plans are to, uh, to get this repaired. Yeah, good morning, Commissioners Davis Purcell, Buildings and Grounds Director. So um, if you look at your screen here, we can kind of show you the extent of the damage. Um, this is from the interior of the shop looking up. We have about uh, a four-foot section of a truss that's burnt completely. Um, there's also a piece of truss here that is burnt at the end. Um, we did have a temporary wall installed right here. You can kind of see it in the corner of the picture um, to kind of help ease some of those issues. Uh, photograph two is up in the attic space. Um, you can see missing uh, truss in the areas where it's dashed lines here. Um, and then the girts and the purlins are completely gone in some areas and charred in others. Um, 
the, uh, photograph three here is the exterior. Um, you can see this column, it's a wood column. Um, and the bottom section is in good shape and it is in the concrete. So we would actually leave this and brace it here um, and add on to this column uh, to fix that. Um, and then there's just some more pictures of the burnt ends of the truss. Um, so I believe, and this is from Albertson Engineering here. Um, and I want to give them some, you know, some thanks because they, they came out, I think it was last Thursday yep. and got us this information in time to show uh, or to present to you guys. Um, so again, you can see their structural repair items are listed here. Um, we do have, we had also a smoke mitigation team out there as well to assess what they need to do on their end, um, as well as skull uh, construction to be the general contractor on this project. Um, and uh, we've also, uh, and Walter can speak on this if you need him to, but we have had the insurance assessors out there as well. So again, uh, this is important to get passed through because if not, um, if we follow all the procurement uh, you know, laws, we will be pushed into December probably until we can uh, get anything moving forward. Um, if, if we do get this passed today, we're hoping to have this repaired by the end of October. So stand for any questions. Thanks, Davis. Is, is there any questions for Davis? Sure. Yeah. sure. Mr. Drews. The, what is, what's the age of that building? It's built. Go ahead. Built in 2003. Okay. So is there any code issues relative to fixing this? I mean, is there any code changes been made that require additional work? That's a good question. I do not know that. Okay. I'm not sure. Done? Yeah. Ms. Hadcock. So do we have an estimate of the costs of this? We do not. Skull is working on that now. We had to get Albertson Engineering out there to look at the structural um, items, and then we still have yet to hear back from the mitigation team. So uh, as soon as we get those numbers back, um, we can bring it forward or we can set up a special meeting to discuss it. Uh, we were hoping to have something before this meeting, but we don't have anything yet. For me, I'd like to see the numbers before I give a procurement or an emergency fund on something that we uh, don't know at this point how much it's going to cost. Number two, um, I'd like to see how much the insurance is covering some of those costs, if it's all of it, because that's what's money you have to spend. So if you're spending something more than what the insurance is covering, um, I believe that's not good business. Um, number two, or number three, um, I'm not against an emergency fund because some of the stuff you might need to order right away, Joe, but I also believe in your budget you could use it if, if the insurance costs are coming back to you, you can, you can take it out of your budget at this point and then bring it back. Um, and like I said, I heard 1.1 million it might cost, but this oh. is only 500,000 because you're going to cover some. Um, again, oh, if I may. Go ahead, Joe. Um, so the, the building cost, we estimate, you know, I, just a swag, purely a swag, you know, if that's where the half million dollars came from. The 1.1 is the total loss of the loader, the pickups, all of that stuff. That's where the 1.1 comes from. Um, you know, if, if we don't get something started today, like Davis said, it'll be, you know, December before we get this fixed. And we all know what the, what the, weather has the potential to be like, and this is on the north side of a wall. Um, we do have it buttoned up for the most part, um, but it's definitely not weather tight at this point. So um, I, I hear what you're saying, but I mean, we've been working on this since it happened to try and get numbers put together. You know, it just takes time to get everybody out there, get an engineer out there to uh, assess the, the truss situation. Um, you know, initial talks were, okay, can we, put stuff on the on the truss and make it work or do we need to replace the entire truss that's what the engineer was out there for so um, we just don't time is of the essence i feel um we're already in september and um you know winter is is right around the corner so i appreciate that joe but i also had a building that burned and had to cover the costs and then the insurance basically told us how much my husband of course is a project manager so he knew the costs so that's what we do at Pennington County. We have a project manager, a person that should know those costs, or at least a guesstimate. 
And then at that point, we covered it until we got um, that money um, to take it out of, I think, uh, money that it could be 200000 it could be a million five, um, and not know those numbers for insurance before you spend. Um, to me, I wouldn't do that in my business. Uh, we also had it happen at the uh, Tennessee County Housing Authority where one of our buildings got hit. We had to secure that building like we have done, and it took us a little bit to get the numbers, and then we got the numbers, and then we went forward the same way I'm saying today. We could have called an emergency and done it as well, but... Um, bottom line is you need to know the numbers before you decide that you do the spending. And I think for the public to be up front, they should know those numbers and what you're spending before you spend it and know those insurance costs. So to, we keep calling it discretionary funding and now we're calling it emergency. I understand some of that might be, but I think some of that can be covered in your budget until that insurance money comes in. It's bad business to do an insurance adjustment and spend more than you're actually getting to... Um, to replace what you needed. And Gary made a good point. Uh, some of that might not be up to code, so it might cost more than you think just to bring it up to code now. I'd like to know those numbers before I call it an emergency. That's just me. I could add uh, something. Um, so we will go through these estimates with a fine tooth comb. Um, and one of the main, uh, really the only one that's gonna stick out to me is the smoke mitigation. Because um, when you get a team in to do uh, that type of work, it can get pretty excessive yes. and overkill. So we will make sure that does not happen. But as far as any structural repairs or repairs to the building, those costs are going to be what they are. I don't think you're going to, even if you've got multiple estimates, they're not going to vary much. So we're not saying we're, we're just going to go and spend all this money to get it fixed. Uh, we'll make sure we're all on the same page with Albertson and Skull um, and the smoke mitigation team um, you know, to reduce those costs if we can um, because... At the end of the day, um, most of this will be covered. I think it's going to come down to the smoke mitigation um, aspect that uh, um, they they might um, get a little too carried away, and we can we can stop them from doing and, that. Sure. So. And I appreciate that too. But the smoke mitigation, we went through that as well, obviously, because we had ten units burn plus the office. So yeah, I understand. But I'm just saying the numbers count to me about how much, I, it's not like you're gonna overspend, it's not just for me, it's for your public that that's their money that you're calling an emergency with where there's no, there's no total of what that's gonna cost. So to do a guesstimate on it, and then also I'd like to see more companies than the same company every time doing our business here in Pennington County. So um, the company that we do business with, and we have been doing business with a lot of it, I appreciate, and they're a great company. But I also, even with, when I was in the city, or even with Pennington County Housing Authority, we, we try to trade companies so everybody has a fair share at, at Pennington County for this. So, um, or in um, different areas, even in my uh, own business. So. Um, to give everybody a fair shake of, of some of the cash flow that um, people are putting out. But my main issue here is not, people always think it's a trust for me, but I run a business, I have to see insurance costs, I have to know how much I can spend, and then if those numbers come over, I have to figure out what I'm going to do, and if they come under, then, thank you Jesus, then maybe we have to do other stuff. If but the But the thing that Gary just brought up is totally right, because remember, grandfathered in, we had the motel, we had to change the <coughs> codes. We had to change how we did the plumbing, we had to change, and it cost a lot more than we thought, but we got those guesstimates ahead of time, and that's some huge numbers when you have to do fire suppression and some other stuff to make those up to code. So that's why I said, those numbers are gonna be huge before you call an emergency. Then once you get those numbers, I'd be willing to say, okay, this is emergency, let's get it done. So if it can be done in the next week or two, they did ours pretty quick um, within two weeks, and we were good to go. So, Okay, Mr. Lassiter. Mr. Chair, all right, Joe and Davis, uh, I was in that uh, building committee meeting when we talked about this. Uh, and yeah, we definitely were hoping to have some numbers, and I, I guess I'm kind of confused why we don't have some of those numbers unless it's really going to take a while, because even an insurance company, they can come out and they can measure, they can figure that out. I mean, whenever my house had some damage, they had a rough estimate for me 24 hours later. I get it. There's some other things that are involved in this, some structural, and you had to have an engineer, you had to have them out so that they can give that information out there. But before I'm comfortable just saying $500,000 in discretionary spending, do you already have it figured out what that $500,000 is for? I think I understand what Commissioner Hadcock is 
is concerned with is if we just give you $500,000 for discretionary spending on this versus we're giving you $500,000 to, you know, button that building with the steel appropriately to seal it up for the winter, we kind of want to know what we're spending that money on. We would be uh, spending that money to repair the building. Um, so it, nothing would go, this discretionary spending has nothing to do with the equipment that was lost, like the loader and the two vehicles. This is uh, just to repair the structure itself, completely repair it. And I think maybe, you know, I, I don't know about you, Davis, but I'd be willing to say, let's just get the structure safe, right? We've got the temporary wall up there and then we can leave the smoke mitigation piece out of it. I know that, you know, them guys are like sharks when they, they, they see this stuff, you know, but um, just simply structurally <coughs> get it repaired and get it sealed up to the elements um, is what needs to be done right now. Follow-up, Travis? No, sir. I'm Mr. Good. Chair. I, I'm going to make one comment before I go to you, Ron. Um, I support this moving forward. You know, this is a life safety issue. I, too, when I first seen the pictures, I thought that the trusses could be saved. And thank you guys for all the hard work that you did with buildings and grounds getting and getting that stuff secured. Because cosmetically, it... it looks i didn't think it was that bad until i seen the, the trusses and had to understand that the trusses need to be replaced and and with the winter time coming up and the amount of road work and snow removal that, that area uh requires and for the workers there we got to look at that for their safety also so uh, i just wanted to make that comment thank you guys for, for securing that up and getting right after that because you still got people working out there mr ross connect uh, Mr. Chair, you know, if this happened in April or May, I might uh, not uh, think it was an emergency, but I do believe that we could see snow here any time in September, and I think it is an emergency. This building is not a complex building. It's wood frame metal sided, and and uh, with my experience in this type of construction, I I like the word up to, but I hardly doubt we're going to even come close to that $500,000. $500,000 should, in my opinion, cover it, worse if there's some unknowns that we don't know about. But uh, I, uh, the only thing that I would add is if we, when we repair the building, that we don't go overboard. We just do the bare minimal, because the, the utility of the building is a heated shop, and I just want it to be a heated shop. I don't want a, any fancy siding or anything uh, in excess uh, relative to putting the building back to the utility of a heated shop. So once again, uh, I think it's an emergency and I'm gonna support it. Any further comments? If I may just make one further comment, I would like to thank the, the volunteers, the, the volunteer firefighters that came out to this. They had a really long night that night. They were on a couple of different fires south of there and north of, north of the, our building. Um, and funny enough, so I believe it was Whispering Pines was the first fire department on scene at this building. So um, it was uh, just having stance that uh, they were there and able to assist. And everybody that was there um, worked together to, to get the building um, put out and save it from any further damage. So I appreciate that. And it um, goes to show that our, our volunteer fire departments are worth their weight in gold. So. Thank you, guys. With that, I'll go ahead and I'll make the motion to authorize Benton County Highway Superintendent and our Benton County Buildings and Grounds Department to execute contracts as necessary up to 500000 utilizing the accumulated building funds for emergency procurement of required repairs to Benton County Highway Shop in Wall, South Dakota. As a result of the lightning strike fire on August 22nd, 2024, that caused significant interior and exterior structural damage to the building, which is vital to the timely operation and maintenance of the highway system in the community, and which possesses a threat to public health and safety and welfare in its present condition, pursuant to SDCL 5-18A-9. Second. Moved by LaCroix, seconded by Ross Connect. Any further discussion? Mr. Chair. Mr. Laster. I'm just going to make my comment on, I, I am supportive of this with caution. Uh, again, I don't re re really like discretionary spending, but I also understand, you know, if we were like 
Commissioner Roskinick said earlier, if we were in April, I wouldn't be willing to jump on it so fast. Uh, I do need, I do know that we need to get it buttoned up. We need to make it safe without those purlins, without the stabilized um, cross beams, those, uh, what are the girders? Trusses. Trusses. Um, we could, if we had a snow event, we could have a problem. And I, I do believe it's in the, in the safety aspect that we don't want to cause any further cost to the da uh, to the county if uh, if we didn't have it buttoned up, sealed up, and structurally supported. So uh, I do believe it's going to be more than $500,000. We do have insurance on the building. I believe they'll pay what it is that we're utilizing in these uh, accumulated building funds. So the accumulated building fund money will go back to that fund for future projects or future emergencies. So I'm, I'm hesitant, but I am supportive of this based on the nature and the timing of it. Chair. You, you done, Travis? I'm done. Ms. I appreciate it. everybody wanted to secure their building and do what they need to do, but we had a car through a building and had it secured in two days from a company. So, um, and that's two floors with a truss with uh, two of uh, the floors that could have collapsed with a electrical, um, could have been a gas or electrical fire. It took two days. Um, so, I'll just tell you, and then they had basically, um, that construction company was out and gave us with the insurance company uh, the major issues, and then um, with that gave us some of the guesstimates. So I appreciate everybody um, and the snow and all the things that you're talking about, but we were right on East North there, and it was secured in two days. My building with my husband, of course, got that secured in about two to three days with some of the uh, other um, friends of his. So. Um, to make it safe, to make it workable until we could get it um, basically where we needed to go and then find out the real, like I'm telling you, the real issues with code and things that have to change. So um, I'm going to disagree uh, respectfully with our group just from being through it twice and knowing those costs um, don't have to be discretionary or otherwise. Um, those numbers should be in uh, pretty quick, and uh, I think you can secure that building and make it safe um, it looks like you pretty much did until you get the money and the insurance costs. Thank you. Any further discussion? There are none. All in favor of the motion on the floor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carries with one no. Thank you, Commission. Thank you. Item number 10. Items from Commission Manager. This item is for the 2024 proposed resolutions and policy statement changes with the South Dakota Association of County Commissioners. And we're going to turn this over to South Dakota uh, President of the South Dakota Association of County Commissioners, Commissioner Gary Drews. Mr. Drews. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. I think you've all seen the proposed resolutions and policy statement revisions, and if there's any questions on them, I'd be happy to try to answer. Otherwise, these will be submitted to the convention in two weeks. Is there any questions for Mr. Drews? Chair. Mr. Hadcock. Why did they change the resolution on uh, concerning filing of county commission position vacancies? What was the need for change? The uh, currently it calls for uh, immediate, the word immediate is in there, and so it more impacted those uh, commissions that only meet once a month. Okay. And so, uh, according to the legal advice, the one the one um, county had received is they they received a resignation at a commission meeting, and it was suggested they had to make that appointment that day. Okay. Because. They were meeting for another month. And so that's the reason for this proposal coming in, to try to give everybody a little bit of adequate time, uh, we'll make it uh, make the uh, citizens aware that there is a vacancy on the commission and give them sufficient time to uh, uh, receive applicants and be able to uh, uh, interview if that's what they choose to do or however, whatever selection process they decide to make. But, that was that was the reason for it. It actually came from Lawrence County. I appreciate that, Gary. The word immediate is is worrisome because you already know, like you explained, that to replace somebody that quick, um, even through city council, and I've watched that process, it's not immediate. 
it's a long, not a long, but a month or two, and sometimes they don't replace them. They wait because it's close enough for the next uh, set of people to come in, so I appreciate that. Um, do you have any other issues moving forward on revenue sources for South Dakota County? Any updates um, from that resolution? Have they read it? Have they, uh, legislators, and have they had any thoughts on that resolution? No, that will be, uh, uh, all of these can be discussed at the convention before they're adopted uh, or before anything is considered. And so I'm anticipating that there may be some discussion at that time. Okay. And I apologize, I won't be here. It's my birthday and the 14th through the 21st or 22nd, I think at this point, we're trying to figure out the dates, but um, I'll be gone and we'll be in an area where I can't just chime in. So um, that's why I was asking today, Gary, if you had any information on it. And again, I'll be missing the, the county um, Association 110th Annual, which will be pretty cool, 17th through the 18th. So thank you for sharing. Is there any further questions on this item? Mr. Chair. Mr. Drew. As I mentioned, this will be presented to the uh, county convention, which is September 17 and 18. Here in Rapid City, uh, the Resolutions Committee, uh, which will be handling this, will be accepting uh, public comment uh, in regard to one of these. So. Mr. Chair, thank you. I just Mr. want to Chair. thank Commissioner Drew, who served as the president of the South Dakota Association of County Commissioners this year, and for the work that you put into the resolutions and just the work that you put into being the president this year. I, I think it was a very effective year, and I appreciate your service. Thank you. Ditto. Appreciate it, Gary. You did a good job working with these. Any further questions? On the resolution, 2024 resolution. No actions required. Next on our agenda, we have to wait till 10 o'clock for items for the auditor. I would suggest we recess till 10 o'clock. That'll be my motion. Moved by Rosconnect. Second. Seconded by Drews to recess till 10 o'clock. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, I'd look for a motion to come out of recess. So moved. Moved by Drews. Second. Second by Laster. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Next on our items is the 2025 budget, and I'll recognize it. Auditor Cindy Muller, we do have three items to take action on today. Good Let's morning, see. Commissioner. Cindy Muller, Pennington County Auditor. And I know you have my budget memo before you, and I don't know if you just want me to go down the list or if there's specific questions you have about anything. I think uh, let's, let's work on the GIS contract first and then get a motion on that and then we'll move to the 24 seven and get a motion on that, get them taken care of. Okay, okay. So as I had explained before with the GIS budget, um, the original budget um, was reduced when Holly had spoke with staff there. And so we do need to increase that. I know you also got a, an email um, from them explaining that they would not take the reduction this year. So I do need a motion to um, increase the general fund GAS budget by $38,162 to meet the original request. Is there any questions for Cindy on that? If not, I'd look for a motion. Sure. Mr. Drews. I'd move to increase the GIS contract of the city of Rapid City by $38,000. $162 for a total of $278,162. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Mr. Chair. Mr. Drews. Just, you know, initially that's what I think the we, uh, city of Rapid City had said they needed. Uh, the person was gone when I think Holly made the contact to see whether or not that had to be in effect for the 25 budget. Uh, that's why it was left out, and uh, when that person came back, they said, yes, it definitely needs to be there. 
in order to accomplish uh, the goals of both the city of Rapid City and Pennington County. Yes, agreed. Any further discussion? Hear none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Next is the 24 seven. Yeah, the, the 24-7 um, general fund operating transfer to the 24-7 fund was not included in the budget. That was my error. I, it was on their revenue side um, of their budget, but I neglected to put it on the general fund side as an operating transfer. So in order to correct that, we would need a motion to increase the general fund operating transfer to 24-7 fund by $79,626. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Lasky. So, is that something that we just missed, and it's not a, a cost on the taxpayer? It's a revenue source, twenty four seven, and it just gets transferred over. Is that kind of what it is? Because the last meeting we understood it was like it was going to come out of our general fund to offset that expenditure. That is correct. It does come out of the general fund. It's an operating transfer from general fund to support twenty four seven fund. And the sheriff is here. If you have further questions on the need for that. Is this the first time we've had to do that, Sheriff? Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, I should have <laughs> no, verified that. I've still got the floor. You've got the floor. <clears throat> is, that, is that something we normally do every year, or is this kind of like an offset from the revenues that you get? I just want to make sure I'm understanding this, because the last meeting I was under the, under, under the understanding that uh, this is the first time we've had to make a transfer to, uh, to cover the costs that weren't covered by the program itself. Correct. Uh, Chairman, if I may. Mr. Mueller. Brian Mueller, Pennington County Sheriff. And I apologize for not being at the last meeting. I probably could have cleared this up, but I was out of town for work. The 24-7, uh, this is about our 15th year. Might be off a year or two on that. And that, that program was set up to be a fender pay. And it has been for a majority of the time. And actually, we built quite a surplus up from that. So sometimes we've had two, three $300,000 in the, in the uh, account. What do we call the account? Fund. The fund. I always say that wrong. So let her, instead of saying it wrong and having her correct me, I'll just let her tell you. So in the 24-7 fund, <clears throat> and as, as you remember, uh, through COVID, we, we, that fund was pretty quickly depleted. And because uh, the courts shut down, a lot of participation dropped off during COVID. And in 2020, that fund reduced by $164,000. So over the last five years, the fund has reduced by about $211,000. So if you remember last year, and I think I sent a letter back out to you all at the end of the week last week that had the budget narrative from last year and the budget narrative again from this year, I explained last year was the first year, which, which is this year actually, 2024, is the first year that we requested tax dollars for 24-7. And we requested a seventy-nine thousand, just a little bit over seventy-nine thousand for this year's budget, uh, because we have depleted the fund, and we've cut back everything we can. So back in twenty nineteen, I think that our budget was around five hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars, and we we collected over six hundred thousand dollars in revenue. But every year since then, uh, we've depleted that uh, that fund. And uh, we've cut, we've cut staff, we've cut hours, we've reduced that budget by over a hundred thousand dollars, and we're getting, we're getting pretty close to the point where we're getting it balanced back out again. Like I said, we did request seventy nine thousand dollars this year, but I just looked at our fund this morning and our budget projections for the year. I think we're going to only have to use about forty thousand of that this year, and we, I continue to uh, work with the state's attorney, the public defender, and the presiding judge on. Who exactly do we have on 24-7? Should they be on it, and what's that look like? So we are going to make some changes um, to that 20 to the 24-7, how it operates, who's on it, what that looks like, and my hope is that'll have a positive impact on the budget. And then also, since we've started this on the PBT portion, the fees have not changed in 15 years. So I'm on the state committee, state 24-7 committee, and we're having conversations with the attorney general on potentially trying to change the rule to get a fee increase to cover the, to offset the cost. But a majority of the counties that are running 24 seven are running uh, at a deficit and having to put taxpayer dollars on there. And I know that wasn't intended to do that, but just to give you an example, we have uh, 410 participants today. In pre-COVID, we were running 
550 to 700 participants. That's why the fund was so healthy because it's a fender pay. Each time they come in, they have to pay. And uh, 188 of the people that are on it today are out on bond. So if we did not have the 24-7 program, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as to say 188 people that were out on bond would be in the jail. But there would definitely be some individuals that would be in jail if that 24 7 uh, was not operational and over 200 people are out being monitored on either a sentence on probation or on parole also so some of those people that the judge feels comfortable letting them out state's attorney's office feels comfortable um, recommending that they be released because that 24 7 is out there monitoring some their either drug use or alcohol use and uh if just two of those people landed in jail, it would cost us over $80,000. So there's a cost benefit, even if we have to put a little bit of taxpayer dollars in. But like I said, we're trying to reel that in. And my hope is by next year, we'll get that back to um, offset. Mr. Laster. No, he answered my final question, which is when do we plan on having it roughly back to even so that there's no taxpayer dollars required for it? Chair. Ms. Hancock. Thank you, Brian. I sent you a text yesterday and it didn't come to mind until I was going through my packet for the fourth time. So I apologize. I usually give you more of a heads up. Um, so I'm for 24 seven and you knew that a long time ago. It's just that the funding source um, was always told it was from offender pay. But I have to ask you the question now that you answered it. If you had 550 to 700 participants in COVID, isn't that more money that should be put into it? Meaning if it's offender pay? if the average is usually 400 to 500? That's correct. We had, uh, when our participation was uh, 550 to 700 people, our fund was healthier. We were collecting over $600,000 a year in revenue. Okay. Now that our participation has dropped down to closer to 400, and that's something that's not within my control. That's controlled by the courts, by the state's attorney, by the public defender's office. Our, our uh, participation <coughs> down, you know, it's been running in that, 400 to 450 range. So the dollars that come in are, are less. We're collecting about uh, 400,000 instead of six to 700,000 a year in that fund. Okay, so your average was four to six before COVID and then you had more which upped it. You had extra money, but then the next year, I know you didn't need it. You just needed the last two years. So that's the numbers uh, coincide. Um, that for the future, now that you know that you're being subsidized at this point um, by 24-7, uh, you're mm -hmm. going to do a fee change. You're willing to change uh, what the issue is. Uh, thank you for all the numbers. And also, I apologize. I left the house about 7 o'clock this morning. You sent me the email for the rest of the questions, and but you answered about the $211 and some of the questions up here. The numbers, and that's what I like when people have the numbers and they're showing why, when, how, and where. And it's not just for me, and I'll keep saying this. When they come up to ask Brian and they watch this and they say, well, now we understand why 24-7 that we had to subsidize you. It's nice to know all the numbers and how you got there and why you're there. And that also for the future, um, you want to fee change and you want to try some different stuff that's going to make it so in the future we don't have to subsidize it, hopefully. But again, 24-7 is a good program. It's not against that. I just wanted to know the numbers. So thank you, Brian. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? I will say thanks for the, the note, uh, Brian, on this. And I, I do believe it's saving taxpayers money by not housing them in the jail. And not only that, but also putting structure in people's lives that probably didn't have it to start out with. And so I think with this program, I think as you see it's going, I think you're going to make the improvements to, to make the changes that are needed to, to make it more equitable. So I appreciate it. Thank you. With that, I would go to the board for a motion. Mr. Chair. Mr. Ross. I move to increase the general fund operating transfer out of the 24-7 fund by 79,626 to correct an error. Moved by Ross Connect. Okay. Seconded by Drews. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Now, next, this comes up to uh, the county fire operating transfer. Uh, the auditor has given us three options uh, to look at. Chair. Ms. Hadcock. If I could, I'll have Val come up and explain uh, her numbers, and then maybe um, we can get the right numbers based on 
um, how she figured, because I went through Cindy's numbers and I went through Val's numbers, so I think it'd be appropriate that um, the paper that you had got on your dais today shows where she got the 158, maybe uh, they can figure out of that discrepancy. I don't think, when I'm reading through Cindy's or Val's, um, they're both um, on the same page of, of the numbers, and I don't think either one was wrong. I just think we need to find the right uh, amount for that. So Val and Damien, if you're coming up, Chair, if they could do that, I think it would clear things up. I would go to the auditor first. Um, if you look at number two on of the three options that I laid out, you'll see that I explained that the shortfall in the revenue is the mandated 5% factor that we have to apply to the budget in order to do the means of finance. So any fund that levies, you have to add in 5% of the budget so that you make sure that your revenue covers any uncollected taxes that might so that would happen be, throughout the year. That is the difference, the 25,193. Okay, and that's added on to the 158,946 that they, yep. is the 5%. That is correct, yes. Okay, so that's where it's come from. Val, did you still want to make a comment? Or does that answer? Okay. Mr. Chair. Mr. Drews. I like the uh, option two that uh, the auditor provided us. Any further discussion? Yes, can we discuss Ms. that? <laughs> so the increase of general fund <coughs> operating transfer out to fire fund in case the fire fund revenue transfers, which covers the amount currently cash applied, the number is the shortfall in revenue mandated 5% as shown as the means of finance. With this, you could also move that the auditor to reduce the general fund assigned to fire reserve by 184, in which reduce that reserve to 315. So, can I ask the question? Is that including? Is that the 600,000 minus the 100,000 that you're talking about, Cindy? Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, yes that's correct. Okay, and that's I all do I needed see that I did have an error on there that it's not in case and in case the fire fund increase the fire fund revenue operating transfer in. Okay, I appreciate that. Just so we know that we're we're going to have a half million in the fire service fund at this point. Yeah. The hundred that's going to be subsidized um, will be some of the eighty four or whatever, and then the other is general fund, not still coming out of any more reserves. Am I correct? Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. With that, I would look for a motion. Sure. Mr. Drews. I would uh, move to increase the general fund operating transfer out of the fire fund and increase the fire fund revenue operating transfer in from the general fund by $184,139, which covers the amount that is currently showing as cash applied in the fire fund. Second. It's been moved and seconded, and that was to uh, this number reflects the 5% factor. Uh, with this, you could also move the auditors to reduce the general fund assigned. I'll do that as a second motion. Oh, second motion. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion on the floor? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Chair. Mr. Jurors. I'd also then move that the auditor reduce the general fund assigned to the fire reserve by the $184,139 in 2025, which would reduce the reserve to $315,861. Second. Moved by Drew, seconded by Rosconnect. Any Chair. further discussion? Ms. Hadcock. Okay, there's a reason why there was a half million in there. I thought we just said that we're gonna take, leave the half million in there with the 100 coming off with the general fund. Now we're saying we're gonna take some of their reserves, that is a five-year plan, um, taking this money out of their reserves. What other department have you done this to besides the fire service? When they have a five-year and 10-year plan, have you taken their reserves or their, basically their um, capital costs or things that they need? And why would you do that to a fire service board that gave a five-year and a 10-year plan? Mr. I guess I'm not understanding. Mr. Chair. Mr. Drews. I, I, if that was a question towards me, I think that uh, I don't know of others that have a reserve such as this. And so 
this would, in my opinion, what this would do is uh, you would need, if you wanted to get that back to the 500,000, that, uh, that gives you this next year uh, a way to figure out how to get that back up to the $500,000 for the 26 budget. Chair. Ms. Hadcock. Okay, so these are first responders. We already saw from the fire um, being out in um, Wonderwood and to our highway department, how much they save money. We're worried about taking money out of reserve for a fire service board who needs radios and equipment and have came here over and over again. And now today, because we already know we're gonna have to use um, general fund in order to fund someone that we decided as a board to fund uh, for that board because they needed her, that now we're gonna reduce it. Um, that disappoints me because, um, I'll, I'll say this again, you spent $11,647,000 on other departments that had it in their reserves, obviously, because we did not increase the budgets, but we're worried about $200,000. Then we added $3.6 million onto that, which is about $15 million in wages that we raised, but we can't give first responders their $184,000. We're going to reduce reserves, which actually mean a lot to them because they use them, just like any other department, but they don't play the game. They're not padding their budgets. They're not making it so they're using FTEs extra. And then I think that's very disappointing. I think uh, from what I've seen, um, this fire board has worked very, very hard on this budget and very, very hard to get those reserves where they need to be. And they're doing better than ever. And now all of a sudden, we're going to play the game. We're going to take a hundred something thousand when we just gave discretionary funding of five hundred thousand, and we're giving giving money to things at buildings and excessive wage increases, and we can't afford to pay our firemen out of our general fund. That's four hundred and seventy volunteer fire departments. We want to take their reserves. I've never seen this since I've been here, except one time when Denny had to leave, and those reserves were were put back and then play politics on this thing and say, I think they should stay within their levy is what I've heard from uh, department heads and uh, some of the people from our office. So um, very disappointed that we would even make this motion or even want to make this motion at this time and I won't be in agreement with it just from all the spending I've seen based on 184,000. Thank you. Thank you. My my comment on this is I think 315861 is still a healthy reserve and and if something was to happen they could come back to us and we could would just just like buildings and ground did for emergency or whatnot could come back to us and we could approve that. So it uh, it's just that if it goes into that fund it's restricted that the okay, county yeah. doesn't get we can't use it. So that's that please I'm be respectful. That, that's my, my understanding of this. Be respectful. Ma'am. Sir, I'm just saying be respectful. Please don't, do you do please don't talk out of turn. Well, you're talking to me. You're saying be please. respectful. You're talking out of turn. So that, that, that's my, my thoughts on this. So, Ms. Mr. Chair, if I may. Cindy. The, the way the budget was originally prepared was to take that 184000 out of the fire fund. Yeah. So that would have reduced their reserve down to about 19.5%. So with this motion, you're going to leave that 184000 in the fire fund. You're just reducing the general fund fire reserve by that amount. Mr. Chair. Mr. Laster. So what is going to be their total amount of reserve fund sitting as of today or whenever the final budget goes with this motion and the previous motion. What is that fire fund reserve? I, are they still going to have access to that $500,000 that's currently there? Say that one more time. I'm sorry. <clears throat> do I or do I not understand that they have about $500,000 in a reserve fund at this moment in time? They would have $500,000 at the end of 2024, yes. Even with the, the motion that we just made and with this motion, 
if they don't have to pull any funds out of there, they would still have a fund balance of 500000 With the motion, it's going to pull the 184000 out of that 500000 So we're going to remove money that we've banked in that account and move it to where? To the fire fund. So what am I missing? I, I guess maybe that's just my question. What am I missing Mr. here? Mr. Chair, if I may. Go ahead, Cindy. You're, you're comparing the fire fund to the general fund, which is where that assigned reserve for fire is sitting. So the 500000 is in the general fund in the assigned to fire reserve. Okay. The other is their actual fire fund, which is where that levy is. So there's two different funds we're working with. To get them that 500000 No. No, the 500000 would be in the general fund assigned to fire reserve. Chair. Hold on. Mr. Blaster. I just want to make sure that what they gave us in their budget for the reserve is going to be there. And if any of these motions are going to reduce that, that's where I have a problem. That's what I'm just trying to clarify. And I haven't got us. Sounds like that money is going to be there, but I'm not 100% sure that it is. Or is it going to be in two different funds to make that amount? And I just want to make sure the fire um, administrator and his assistant, Val, know this. And so I want to understand as well. Mr. Chair, I didn't add the two funds together because in my books, they're totally separate. But they will still have the 184000 in the fire fund because you're going to be using that 184000 out of the general fund assigned to fire reserve. Does that help? Plus the 315. No, that would, no. If you reduce that, it would be down to the 315. They're reducing the. You're reducing that 500000 down by the 184000 So then they're only going to have access to 315. Plus what they have in the fire fund. They'll still have that 184000 in the fire fund. It's just moving over to the fire fund. Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, what does that do structurally? I mean, why, why do we have to move it from there instead of keeping it allocated in the general fund? Maybe that's the piece just of this that those, I'm missing. It's, it's more about um, the, the duties of the fire fund, what that money is to cover, and to make sure that we're covering, spending it according to function, on my books for the Department of Legislative Audit. That's all I got for right now, Mr. Chair. Ms. Hancock. So to be respectful, you're taking 184 out of general fund and put it in fire fund. You're reducing, out of, out of 2024, you're reducing and you're making it three I didn't see the number, 315861. So they will not be whole in 2025, is what she's trying to say. So I think that's being disrespectful because there's a fund for a reason that was built up for a reason because they needed it. And we have not taken anybody else's out of their reserves or anything else except for the fire fund. And I'll keep saying, why this fund? Why this was brought up, I don't understand. I guess, um, again, you have 470 volunteer firemen that are going to um, ask for $184,000 when they just saved a building over a million dollars for Pennington County and saved that building. And we're worried about 184 because it does not cover. And again, if that was the intent, then we should have told Val and everybody else that um, we were going to be subsidizing her through the uh, general fund, which we knew from the beginning. So to be respectful, we haven't done this to any other department. In fact, we increased our budget by $7 million or more. So um, I don't think it's a hard ask, and I think it should come out of the general fund, the 184, because it will have to for the future, and leave the reserves at 500. And when those are depleted, if they're depleted 184 for next year, we put it back up to uh, 500. And then um, if they didn't have a plan, if they didn't have this piece of paper that lines everything out and tells it's for equipment and what it's for, 
Um, we have every department here that's done that, and we haven't taken any of their reserves. In fact, we have paid for phones up to $600,000. We have paid for um, equipment. We have paid for everything else. And now when the firemen are asking this ass, I think it's disrespectful to take their money and tell them, you can live with the 315, um, even though we haven't done this to anybody else's fund except yours. So, my opinion. Any, any <clears throat> final comments? Mr. Chair, if I may, I guess my final comment would be that the fire fund is a little bit different than all of the other budgets that are within the general fund in the fact that they have a levy to support that fund. And the budget has gone well over what that levy could support. The levy itself can be, um, I want to say, it can be as high as 0.60. And due to annexations and values, those sorts of things that have changed our levy, it is down to uh, 0 .6, 0 0.061. So there is an option for them to do an opt-out to support their fund so that all of those functions that are within that fire fund are covered by the levy. Chair. Okay. Hold on, Deb. I want Val wanted to answer a question. Val, did you want to make any comments before I go? I want, I want to just give you the opportunity. Mr. Chair, while she's come up here, can I just ask a quick question? It's to Cindy. In, in the fire service board budget that they submitted, they had 200000 going to the reserve. Was that reduced down to 100000 or are we still looking at the <coughs> current budget with that 200000 there? I just want to make sure. Commissioner Drews had made the motion to reduce that down to 100,000. Okay. Mr. Chair. Mr. Drews. To further answer that question though, uh, the fire administrator then said his intent was not to have more than 500,000 in that fund. So, and I think we adopted that also. So of the $200,000 request, that was reduced to zero. I don't know that there was a motion made on that, Commissioner okay. Drews. Okay. Okay, Val, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, this is just really difficult, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, and I, for one, very much um, just want to say, you know, the budget is a difficult process, and um, this has been hard because... Um, I feel my salary has impacted this greatly, uh, but you as a commission agreed to bring me on full time as the second person in the fire administration office. And um, since all of this has been brought about, uh, this has been very difficult for me. I come to work every day to do my job to the best of my abilities. And I've poured through these numbers and the emails to support the volunteer fire departments. And I carry this because our budget has been increased with my salary. So please know I do not take any of this lightly. But having said that, I've poured over Jerome's narrative that he has submitted to this commission the last several years. And he has very clearly outlined a plan for us needing those reserve funds and what they've been needed for in his narrative. And in the next two years, the funds needed just for 2025 and 2026, um, total over 200,000. And I, I fully understand you want us to come back and, and ask for those, the monies as we need them but as we currently are in an evacuation warning very close to Sheridan Lake Road right now, our departments are important and we need our communication and we need our compressors and we need our cascade and we need our volunteers and we need your support to make that happen. And cutting that reserve to 300,000 when we're in the situation that we're in is frightening to me. And I am not a long-term fire person. I've been in this position full-time for two years. 
and that is scary. We have put off replacing our administrator's vehicle for two years. Um, I have sitting on my desk from coming back from vacation, the bills from the fire that was over a thousand acres in wall right now, $20,000 worth of fuel costs that I have to submit this next month. We never know when those costs are going to come. We don't. And by all means, I, I understand this is difficult. But I would implore you not to cut our reserves past that 500000 because we don't know. And if you take that fund, and we have just for 2024, 2025, and I, I realize this is for our 2025 budget, but just these costs, just to 2026, over $200,000 in anticipated costs. We plan for a reason so that we're not coming in front of you asking for $100,000 when we know these costs are coming. <coughs> And I, I apologize that our budget was not submitted correctly with that OTI line I'm fill, filled out. I do my job to the best of my abilities with the knowledge that I have. And now I know that line item needs filled out. I don't make mistakes intentionally. I do the best that I can with the knowledge that I have. And now I know how to calculate it. And now I know it needs to be filled out. And I appreciate the time to come and speak to you. And I appreciate you asking me um, I just, the situation we're in, and the fire season, we just saw what happened in Camel County. Um, I would just implore you, please, please do not take more of our reserves. Um, I know fire is a special, unique office, and um, there's two of us supporting all of our firefighters who are volunteering. And it may not seem like we need the money right now, but you just really never know. I came back from vacation and opened that envelope and it was $14,000 on one bill that we didn't know we were going to have. And um, just, it's been outlined and I would just ask you to reconsider. Thanks, and, um, Our fire service chair Dave Limblum is here um, as well, and so is Damon Hartman from our budget committee. And Dave would um, ask if he could share a couple words, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Dave Limblum, uh, chairperson of the Fire Service Board, uh, Rancher South Rapid City as well. I think most of you probably received my email, or maybe I hope all of you read my email I sent out a couple of weeks ago talking about this funding. What I'd like to do very first is, is talk about the, the mill levy, the tax levy that is generated for f the fire service in Pennington County. As Cindy said, it, said it's, it's uh, about two hundredths of a mill. Is it? No. My I'm, point zero six one. Point zero six. I'm confusing Custer County. They're at two hundredths. Point zero six six one hundredths of a mill. But but bear in mind, the fire service board does not set that mill levy. We don't have we don't we don't have the ability to to uh, do the opt out, and that's what I believe it would take to change that up to funding the entire. Fire Service Board budget uh, from the mill levy, from the tax levy. That, I believe, is in your, your uh, responsibilities as to how you fund it. So, so the talk about, about not levying up to six-tenths of a mill, I believe, is a decision this board makes, not the Fire Service Board. The Fire Service Board, their main... What I've focused their main goals on is, is forward thinking, and, and that's where that long-range secondary budget, long-range money, talking about the Cascade Trailer Communications vehicles, that money is where I, where, where I expect our board to be focused on. We do obviously put a lot of time into our current budget to, um, and, and I think we're responsible. 
The last thing I'd like to say is I completely reject uh, that our current budget is because of, of uh, personnel changes, uh, full-time employees. I believe our department, I believe this fire service department is moving forward into a professional position and, and I, I fully support and fully think they are doing a, a very good job moving forward. I, I, I would really be afraid if we started moving backwards. Um, with that, folks, I am open to any questions you might have. Chair. My, my question, Cindy, when he says about that levy, because you were the one that said you would be willing to pay more. Is that the commission's responsibility or those would districts? We would have to go through the process, Mr. Chair, of doing an official opt-out, yes. And we would have between January and July 15th of next year to implement that for 2025 taxes pay 2026. Okay. Thanks for bringing that to light because. Thank you. Chair, I'd like to ask yeah. Dave some stuff. Ms. Hadcock. So Dave, how long have we had that five year or 10 year plan since you've been here? We we really developed it on paper. I'm going to say maybe four budget processes ago. It, it's fairly new. It wasn't in place when I was on this board, the fire service board, in uh, about ten years ago. I served uh, several terms on this board. We saw the we saw the need. We 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 saw the need to to not only do better, but to replace what is aging out. So, so that's for your, for your budget process is what I'm gonna say off the cuff. Thank you. Um, on that budget process, it wasn't for emergency, if I remember, it was for equipment and other things at fire service because bottom line, Dave, we had five districts that don't really and can't really find a levy because there's no funding sources in those districts. So to opt out, um, that's why that hasn't been brought forward to a certain extent because, again, um, we're 184,000 short. So, um, again, the reserves have been in there for a while, and we have been using those reserves, and we left them at five. Um, the 100,000 or 200,000 that was taken this year at this point, leave it at three, um, 115,000. What Val just told you, about 200 of that's gonna be depleted and to leave it on the next board to have to do this when this plan has been around for at least, it'd be about, this is our fifth budget since I've been here, um, I think is a disservice. Um, I also believe Val had her numbers right, but we have to get help from other departments in order to get those numbers. And if they're not willing to help on those numbers and find that and tell that number that easily, that it was a 25%, then she came with, up with what she knows. So if you're not the department that is wanting to, and willing to help get that, that number done, what you have done before, and I'm talking about Cindy's, and then have people come and want to help and then are turned down in your department, we're at this place here today because we could have known those numbers and had this done beforehand because they had a meeting that they wanted to meet with me, but there was no recourse on it because no one wanted help from your department per your direction. So in this case, um, Cindy, I know, and I know you have said over the years that they have to stay in their levy, they get a levy, but we have not done that on the fair board. We have not done that in our budgets. They have not padded any of this budget by any means. They do not have extra FTEs or anything else to use for their excessive wage increases if they have excessive wage increases or any increases. If any budget has been between the lines, it's this one. But this is the one that we want to take and they're saying and have said, quit taking our reserves, we need them. If any other department said that, that was in the sheriff's department, uh, we just increased 150,000 with no, not a blink of an eye because we need 24 seven. Are we saying something different to the firemen because of a levy? And if the department wasn't supporting 470 volunteer fire department people, I guess I'd be different if it was just supporting, you know what I mean? Just a few people and it was just a department that was different. 
So number one, you got to be helpful, and you always have been, and I'm going to say something good about Cindy because she has done everything I've ever asked her to do and above. I don't know why that happened, but such is life. We move on. But I would hope at this point that we would fight to keep those reserves, and we do a substitute would be my motion, substitute to keep take it out of general fund, the 184, 139, and keep the reserves at 500. Okay. To keep them whole. Mr. Chair. I'll let you make a motion after you speak. I, I'm not going to make a motion right now. So. Mr. Drews. So uh, I, I think this is where this all comes about, and I think it's uh, become very confusing. Uh, but as of this date, I don't believe that there's ever been a request to take anything from the general reserve and use it for any purposes that those requests have been to take it from their fire fund. So uh, you can disagree with me, uh, Commissioner Adcock, but I think I'm correct on that, that they've never been, and I, I think that's what Cindy told us a month ago, is that they had never actually made a request for it to come out of, come out of the reserve fund. Can out, I answer out that, of the Mr. General Drews. Reverse Fund, the okay. General Reserve Fund. So can I answer that, Mr. So, Drews? He's, when he's, I'm done. Sorry, I thought you were okay. done. And so I, I think that the whole thing has become very confused because had they drawn from this fund in, for, for these expenses that in the past, this fund would have been down and we would probably have been asked to bring that fund back up to an appropriate level. But I don't think that's happened. Can I can I speak to that, please? Val, well, let me speak first, if I could. Hold on, Ms. Hadcock. So um, when we when we subsidized Val, it was general fund. Um, that's how we got the money, and that's how we paid her back pay as well. So that wasn't fire fund, if I'm correct, Cindy. And when I looked at the memo back in the day, it would had to come from general fund in order for Val's um, funding and her back pay, and maybe Carol remembers too, but. That was one time I remember. Um, I can't remember the other years. I'd have to look it up, Gary, but we have subsidized through general fund on these um, uh, fire service board before. And whether you put it under a line item of fire fund, like you're doing this, you're taking them from general fund and put it in fire fund, it's still general fund. Val. Uh -huh. So um, through this process and the questions being asked of us, um, I think, again, it comes down to communication and education and learning. And when that was said to commission meetings ago, the first thing I did was go back and look at our files and um, our documentation. And I had a request from 2022 and a request from 2023 to use those funds and an email that I had sent to Cindy the beginning of the year stating that we were planning to use those funds to replace Jerome's vehicle this year. Um, through this process, I've learned that the terminology being used um, is important because what we felt we were asking was for our reserve funds to be used in 2022. Um, and I have the email right here and it was included in the packet that we submitted for the last commission meeting um, where we thought those funds were being asked for to be used from our reserve funds and they weren't. And then I have an email or the documentation for the request that we thought was being requested from the reserve fund um, in 2023. Um, and it wasn't from the documents that I pulled up from Springbrook to support these where no funds were used. What we submitted and the conversations that we had and we felt as a budget committee and our office is that we were using our reserve funds in 2022 and in 2023, and had planned to use them this year to replace Jerome's vehicle. However, the, it wasn't used. And so we were just as shocked two meetings ago when that statement was made that we never used the funds. And so that's why the first thing I did was go back and look at our documents and our requests, because in the two years I've been here, I knew of two requests that were submitted where we thought the funds were being used, but it was 
a miscommunication again of the terminology being used and the funds being used. And um, I could not find in Springbrook where those funds had been used. So again, it comes down to communication and education and being new in the position. We submitted the documents to the auditor's office under our impression that we were requesting those be used and we were just as shocked as everybody on the commission was that they hadn't been used. Mr. Chair. So that tells you I'm where came from. Give Cindy a chance to follow up first and then I'll go to you. I have no comments. Okay, Mr. Laster. My question is, and just out of curiosity, when you submit those requests, did they say from the reserve fund? And then what fund did it come from? I guess I want to understand the clarification or how, how it ended up getting paid out. So the, the first one, um, this one came, was from the, my first year in 2022. And this one says, the revenue that will support the supplement is from the fire reserve accumulations restricted fund balance 459. And then the one in 2023 um, was, um, this one, let me find the second page here because those came from the tower. Um, this one would be um, paid from reserve accumulations and then um, fire reserve accumulations. And then when I had asked Cindy about this year, how paying for Jerome's vehicle, we felt that that was, was going to come from the reserve as well because that's what was in the five-year plan. Again, I think that comes from perhaps the, the misunderstanding of the two funds and using the correct terminology and the correct labeling and asking the right questions. And I by no means am putting this off on the auditor's office. This is something that we need to figure out and use the correct terminology when we're submitting these documents and doing them correctly. This is all a learning process, obviously, and we have learned a lot in the last month or so about what we need to be doing. Mr. Chair, that doesn't answer the question, where did those funds come from? If they didn't come out of that fund, where did they come from to pay for those things in 2022 and 2023? Mr. Chair, if I may. Mr. They came out of the reserves in the fire fund. There's two reserves. There's two reserves. They have a restricted fund balance in the fire fund, and that is where those came from. So how is that lumped in with that 500000 I, I I guess maybe that's what I'm trying to really understand. They are not lumped together. They're, they're two totally separate funds. How much is in each one right now? Do we know? That, I, like I said, the the... Um, the assigned fund and the general fund to support fire will be at 500000 at the end of this year. And I do not have the cash balance, which is the reserve in the fire fund at this moment. So, Mr. Chair, just for clarification, that 500000 you just said at the end of this year that will be in a reserve fund, right? Is that roughly the translation of what we saw in their budget where they're and what we're trying to make sure that they have $500,000 in reserve funds that they can spend money that they've got for their five-year plan. I just want to make sure that we're not taking that $500,000 and putting it to $300,000 on a five-year plan that they've projected to us for five to 10 years. Does, does that make sense? I just want to make sure what we're doing is not cutting them short. Cindy? With the motion that's on the floor, that is exactly what is happening, is that Reserve in the general fund, the assigned reserve, and be reduced. will be reduced by that 184, whatever it was. Sure. Mr. Gloucester. <laughs> maybe I'm just not asking the question right. I want to know if we have that $500,000, when we get done with the motion and everything's done, that $500,000 that they've allocated and shown us that they've dedicated it for the next several years, is that what they're going to have access to, or is it truly going to be down to 300? So we're yes. roughly taking away that 185. So they're losing 185. Yes. Mr. Chair, if I may. Ms. Between the fire fund and the assigned reserve in the general fund, they aren't 
really losing anything because you are now not taking the 184,000 out of the fire fund to support that budget. Do they have to make another line item out of their levy monies to allocate for the fire reserve fund? No, it will automatically, I mean, it will be in their fire fund, which is their reserve. Set aside in the general fund will be the 315,000. I think after this meeting, I'm gonna to have to visit with you when we're done with Commission A, so you can show me on paper. Sure. Mr. Drews. So, Val, would you agree that had the funds that you had requested, that you thought you were requesting, to come out of the general reserve, uh, had they actually come out of there, that that fund would now be at close to that 315,000 they would have, because you would have used money from the from the reserve fund. Yes, we would have. I believe we would have been at um, around three eighty, three ninety. I and okay. don't I've, quote quote me on that, please. Yeah. Um, I think. I think that's about what it would have been at. But I'm please do not quote me on that. We got a lot of numbers okay. going. No, I understand that. I I was just trying to point out for. Uh, Travis's uh, information that basically had it come out of there like they thought it was going to, that reserve fund would have been reduced. The amount may not have been exactly to that 315, but it would have been reduced. It'd be 300 and something thousand right now. That's right. Okay. Yeah. I do have a follow up question then. <laughs> Are you done, Mr. Drews? I'm done. Mr. Lass. And, and more of this is more for us, but. So then is that fair to say that they should be able to put that 200000 back in their budget so that they can bring it back to 500000 if that's the end goal? Because from what I understand from Cindy's perspective, um, it's been reduced to zero in that line item, right? But I thought Mr. Drew thought it was going to be at 100000 in that line item. So I just want to... I thought it was going to be zero. You thought it was going to be zero. Oh, okay, I thought it was going to be... I thought it was reduced from 200 to 100. I didn't realize it was reduced all the way down to zero. Just now. It was just now reduced to 315 something. I guess maybe does that... Why I'm, I'm now kind of going, wait a minute, we're at 300. I thought we are going to make them whole at 500 when it's all said and done. Any Mr. Final? Chair, if I may. Go ahead. If you take the funds that are in the fire fund and what will be left in the assigned fund balance in the general fund, they will have over 500000 So I'll make the motion. Chair. Yes, I have a motion to substitute to transfer the 184.39 out of general fund into fire fund and leave the fire reserves at five hundred. There's a motion. I'm going to second that one for discussion. Second for discussion. So can I discuss? Go ahead. Follow up. Okay, so what they're doing right now, Travis, is they're taking 184139 and taking it out of general fund. They're going to transfer it to fire fund, which is basically, am I, am I correct, basically the fire levy to increase their budget to 50339 or whatever that is. Then they're going to take from the reserves, which is the 500, reduce them down to 315 something for 2025. What I'm saying is we take it out of the general fund, like we do the rest of them when we do our transfers, 184, 139, put it in the fire fund, like they said, which was the motion, but not reduce the reserves down to 315, 69, I think is what it was. We leave it at 500 for 2025. Is that correct? Mr. <laughs> Chair, if I may. Cindy. If we leave it at 100 going in there, then they're going to be at 600,000. And if we take the 184 just out of the general fund, you're going to increase the general fund operating transfer without reducing that. So it's going to leave that 600,000 at the end of 2025 there. Okay. Chair, follow up on the motion. Um, I disagree with that, Cindy, because um, we also were taking that hundred. Because if we're keeping it at five, we're not going to increase it to six. Because my motion is to take the one eighty four thirty nine out of general fund, put it into fire fund, like you said, 
but then instead of reduce the 315, 69, or whatever that is, we don't take the 184 out of the reserves fire. We leave them whole at 500, and we don't at that point, if you leave it at 500, then the 100, if you want me to make the motion, goes back into the general fund, still leaving 500 at the reserves. You have a follow up? I think I'm following okay. where so, Commissioner Hadcock is going. So, Ms. Cindy, we won't have 600. We only want to make it. Jerome said he only needed five. Gary's right. When we first did the motion, there was 200. This is back in the day. We had 200. We reduced it to 100, if I'm correct. Then that motion was never taken back until today. And now we're saying that we're not giving it, sounds like, anymore. We want to reduce it to 315, whatever that end number is. And I'm saying don't take the and make it 315, make it the 500, leave the transfer out of the general fund into the fire fund. Mr. Chair, if I may. Go ahead. If that motion passes, then I would ask the board that I can, well, obviously we need to go back and rework some numbers just so we know exactly where the budget is. But I think that would only, in, rather than impacting the general fund unassigned fund balance, the 184, 139, it would only impact the general fund, an unassigned fund balance by 84,139. Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am. <laughs> For clarification, I do rem recall uh, the reduction of 100,000. And I do recall Jerome coming up and saying that his mistake was to add 200,000 to it. It should have been kept at five. Yes. If I'm correct. Yes. So I don't recall a motion made to take the whole 200, but I do re recall the one for 100. Right. Mr. So. Chair, that is what I recall as well. Okay. So there was a I, need to, I need clarification on the motion. Could you? So basically the substitute is you take the transfer of 184,139 out of the general fund, you put it in the fire fund, right? And then you leave the 500 in the reserves, which would reduce it down to needing 84, how much? 139. 139 is what Cindy said, Mr. without Chair. affecting the other funds at that point. If I could Cindy. just further clarify that, what I'm hearing you say is that you want to do an operating transfer in the general fund to the fire fund of 184-139. Yes, ma'am. And reduce the long-term reserve budgeted in the fire fund by another 100,000. So that would be zero, and it would leave them at 500,000. Yes, ma'am. At the end of 25. Yes. Okay. And okay, one, so that's clarified. One more thing. And the effect of the budget at that point would be how much? 84? I, I believe when it's all said and done, that would be the 84,139. Okay. Would be which would be the effect on the unassigned fund balance. Which would be the bottom line of how much this is costing us. Thank you for the clarification, Ms. Okay. Any further clarification or discussion? So we're clear on that. On the motion, it's going to leave 500 in there, but it, it ended up reducing that $200,000 request down to zero. Okay. With that, I'd ask for a roll call vote. Yes. Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Unanimously. Board. Next, that brings us up to anything else to be considered for the fiscal year 2025 budget hearing on September 19th. I would ask, Mr. Chair, that we continue the budget hearing to the next um, meeting so that I can get the finalized growth numbers since we have. Um, the tax increment financing districts that have dissolved, that's going to increase our growth percentage, which is going to change our reserves as well. Okay, so moved by Drew's. Second. Seconded by Lasseter to continue 
budget to the next meeting, and then we have a special meeting on the 19th? That, that is the next oh, commission yeah. meeting, correct? Yes. It was on the 19th. Okay. My mistake. Hey, Mr. Chair. So that brings bring us to the 19th. All in. Mr. Chair, just a reminder of this board, I'm actually leaving town and I won't be here for that particular meeting. Okay. Chair. And Deb's going to be gone too. So do we need to change the meeting because we've changed them before? Um, Two of us are going to be gone? Wow. Do we have time to make it so we can approve it later with five commissioners? Mr. Terry. Miss. The budget needs to be approved by September 30th. So. It's unfortunate, but I don't think we can change it. I would, if you have anything you want to bring forward between now and then, we can do it in writing or... I'm not sure. What's the day that has to be passed by? 30th. Or 30th. By the 30th of September, yes. And our, allow, and, our, and our second meeting is going to be on the 19th instead of, and so that we'd have, it would be required to have a special meeting if we were going to do it after the 19th. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes. I'll be back the following week. Yeah, I'll be back the following. I'll be back Monday the 23rd. But... I'm not available at all that week, 23 through the, I've gone from 23 through the 29th. That's only one missing, not two. Well, I mean, we knew the budget time was coming this time of year and it had to be approved. Here we also thought it was going to be September 3rd, so. Well, it, it pretty much is. I mean, we can have, make changes right here now today if we need some more additional changes. Uh, and it's been discussed at every meeting since then. I mean, that's why we asked. We also have a convention and stuff that week, too, so there's a lot going on. Mr. Chair, and I'm just going to point out, when I scheduled for my work, it was a conference that was scheduled that, and so I, I, I scheduled to go to that conference for my work uh, based on the 17th being the in-line schedule with our commission meeting. It wouldn't have been a problem once we accepted the uh, annual convention on those dates. Um, it put a and then moved the uh, board of commission meeting to the 19th. That's where the challenge became the issue. But I had that. It wasn't moved recently. That was moved to the very beginning. Very beginning of when? When we set the meeting dates for the year. Right. So does my conference and so does my, my work stuff. No, I'm just saying we didn't change the meeting date from the 17th to the 19th in recent months. That was done at the beginning of the. Right. setting our schedule for the year yeah yeah my misunderstanding was that the third is when everybody said we we're going to approve the final so <clears throat> that we made i should know by now that it wasn't going to happen that way because it hasn't happened before either we approved it right away or it carried on to the last dates but we've always had special meetings when people couldn't make it so but <clears throat> The budget's been going on for since we passed the provisional. We've added on the agenda every every meeting since then to request changes or concerns, and and we've done that. I think uh, at this point we've got some changes that need to be uh, done in order to bring the final numbers forward for uh, the nineteenth. Um, I think. Absolutely, commissioners, your input's important, but I think we've had ample time to to put in requests, and if you have comments or something along those lines that you would like to send in or changes you'd like to make, you could request them before the 19th. Chair. Ms. Hadcock. 
I don't get why we can't have the special meeting, I guess. Um, it's never heard us before, and we've done it many times before when people couldn't make it. So especially when you have two commissioners, that's pretty important. One once in a while, but I also, during this time, knew I was going to take a vacation in September, and I planned it around that September 3rd we were going to have this approved. So my fault, it's my birthday that week, and I won't be here on the 19th, and I figured with the convention and stuff, we'd probably change it anyway. So my fault. Um, I also believe that on this budget, we're over budgeted on some of these items and that the wage study needs more vetting through the public process at the numbers that we have uh, spent, about 15, 16 million on wages. I don't think it's sustainable. So um, that's my bottom line with this. Um, so it's funny how we how we do things here at Pennington County by opinions and not by facts. So unfortunately, if I'm not gonna be here um, and can't be here because we can't have a special meeting the week before because it's not till the 30th, um, we've changed meeting dates for many people on this board because you ended up having to go to WIR or conventions or different stuff. And at this point, I didn't think it was a big deal if we had to change it again because this is pretty important to five commissioners. So you want to not give us that chance on that last meeting because you have to believe that we should have said everything we had to say. Um, unfortunately, um, I don't think that's good business for us up here and that we all should be able to at least try to be here on that date. Um, I haven't missed many dates because of vacations or anything else uh, during the year. Um, this is pretty important to me. So if you look at uh, my record, usually here or I'm filling in for people. So for once I'm going to be able to go take a vacation um, and I would like if we could reschedule that date so um, we'd have a voice for our um, uh, constituents in our districts. Thank you. Thank you. I, I believe you guys have been a voice for your constituents and you know we knew these dates for in advance and we've been around long enough to know if we change its schedule then one person it starts affecting other people's schedules too and i think it's important to uh, have the hearings for the public and not move them around you can definitely make a motion if you want for a separate and we can vote on it but i i'm believing that uh the 19th is was scheduled at the beginning of the year, and we all knew we were having it. So that's where I stand. So I'll make a substitute motion to have the budget finalized the week after. I don't know what the date needs to be to see if we can at least have the majority of people here. Um, that would be my motion to the have week the after week after. Would be the 26th. The week of the 26th would be my motion. I would second that. Been a motion and a second to have a special meeting on the 26th. Mr. Chair. Mr. Drews. Uh, just make it known. I won't be here that week. Any further discussion? Mr. Chair. Mr. Laster. I, I understand that. It's just like the reason why I brought it up for ours, or for mine anyway, um, just kind of giving note of it. I didn't expect, I didn't realize there was going to be two of us out. Um, but two out versus one out, I think, in the public side, that's a better optic, not trying to play politics, but whenever um, we're going to have a hearing and for the public to see the final decision, I think it's appropriate to have as many commissioners as possible. It's not like I plan to do this to make it uh, a challenge for the Board of Commission to meet that date, but if we're going to meet that deadline and we want to have the most uh, participation possible, I think moving it is the appropriate decision to make, my opinion. Okay. We have a motion on the floor to have a special commission meeting on the 24th of September. I think that's the 26th. 26th. It's the 26th. For the 26th, Thursday the 26th. That's correct. Gerilyn, we'll do a roll call vote, please. 
No. Aye. Aye. Nay. No. Motion fails. So we'll have a budget hearing on the 19th as scheduled. Mr. Chair. A disservice. Ms. Cindy. If I yep. may, if we could have a motion to continue the budget hearing oh, that's right. to the September 19th. Yeah, that's meeting. the original motion. Original motion is to continue the uh, budget hearing meeting to the 19th of September 2024 at 10 a.m. Is there, is there a motion on the floor for that? Yes. I made the motion last year. Second. Second. Oh, okay. Well, Chair. So I'll, we'll do a roll call vote on that, Geraldine. I have discussion. Ms. Hancock. I think you're doing a disservice, and I also think you're proving the three to two vote that you don't want to move that forward for the, yeah. the people. So I think people have noticed it, and you are not at this point in this board I think being and doing justice to the public, being able to have that one other chance with their constituents um, to voice their opinion. So I think you're doing a disservice and what you're doing is wrong. Thank you. I, I disagree, Res respectfully disagree. I think the meeting, three to two. Sorry. it doesn't matter how it went. Yes. It, it, it so matter. roll call vote, please. Aye. No. No. Aye. Okay. Aye. Motion carries. That next brings us up to items from the public. This is a speaker request form is required. This is a time for the members of the public to discuss or express concerns to the board of commissioners on policies and issues affecting county government and its functions and the action will not be taken during this section on any issues brought forth are not properly noticed. Speakers are under this section will be recorded in the minutes by the name of, name of area of interest. And I do have a speaker request form for, from Tina Malali. When you don't have a voice anymore. Good morning, Commissioners. Tina Mullally from Rapid Valley. As of the March 19th, 2024 Board of Commissioners meeting, it was clear that the Board of Commissioners recognized that guns may not be banned on the fairgrounds. You clearly acknowledge the citizens' Second Amendment right to carry a firearm. With that affirmation, I believe my initial letter dated on September 14th, 2023, needs to be addressed and my request for an apology is warranted. My rights were obviously violated. Two other individuals had their First Amendment rights violated. When offered the opportunity to correct the situation, Ron Jeffries on KOTA publicly stated he was, quote, sincerely sorry, unquote, for not getting, quote, the correct message, unquote, out when confronted by NDN's accusation of racial discrimination over a t-shirt incident on August 1st, 2023. In that incident, there was no clear discrimination, but rather a clear violation of several citizens' First Amendment right to freedom of symbolic speech. Mr. Jeffries, as well as the Board of Commissioners and the Fair Board, should be just as sincere in apologizing to me and all the other citizens whose Second Amendment and Fourth Amendment rights to the U.S. Constitution and Article 6, Section 11, and Section 24 of the South Dakota Constitution were violated by your illegal search and prohibition of our right to carry and defend, which is in clear violation of state law. With that said, I am disappointed that I must again request an apology from you, the Board of Commissioners, except Commissioner Hadcock and Commissioner Lassiter, who have already apologized. And this was after you had admitted your error. I'd like it to be put down 
that I think I still deserve an apology. Thank you, Tina. With that, I would look for a short recess before planning, up, so planning can set up for the computer. Do those ladies want to speak? Ladies, did you want to speak at public comment? I've only got one speaker request for him. Oh, okay. So moved. Moved by Drews. Second. Second by Browse Connect to take a break, 10 minute break. All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Okay, I'd look for a motion to go into Board of Adjustment hearing. So move. Moved by Drews. Second. Second by Lassiter. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. I'll recognize Brittany. Good morning, Commissioners. Brittany Molitor, Planning Director. This item is a variance for Reynolds and Livingston, <coughs> Chris Livingston, in all aspects is the agent, is to reduce a setback to a section line for an existing structure that is encroaching in the section line right away in a highway service district. Um, this property is located at 22491 Highway 385, and it is actually for an existing structure. If you look up here, it's for this shop building. It's encroaching a few feet into this section line right away. Um, this has been built for quite some time. Um, this is actually a variance request to clean up because they are trying to subdivide this lot. Um, you will see the subdivision in the rezone and comprehensive plan later in the agenda. Um, but what we are asking is um, for a variance, what they are asking for is for a variance for this encroachment in the section line right of way. Um, and um, staff is recommending denial. However, if there is, um, if the board does wish to approve it, um, we would recommend to um, to <clears throat> conditions be included and one would be that they come back in front of you again and ask for an encroachment agreement um, for this. There is no special condition um, that would excuse literal enforcement of the ordinance as the original building permit did show that um, that the setback could be met. Um, it was just built in the location it, um, where it's encroaching. Is there any questions for Brittany? Mr. Mr. Drews. So how far is the encroachment? Um, it's a couple of feet into the section line right of way. Um, let's see if you look on this map. It's not very much. Um, it's just a couple of feet here that you can see. So what would the process be for them to... Uh, um, I, m I remember doing this on, uh, I think, on Sheely's a few years ago, where they uh, they were encroaching on the right on the. Uh, well, I guess that's a section line. I think mm -hmm. it was, and uh, wasn't very much, but they had to go through the whole process of getting all the signatures, etc., in order to basically abandon. Uh, part of that right well this wouldn't require that um, this would just require the encroachment agreement um, so if and when the highway department would ever want to improve this section line if they chose to um, they would be required to remove this and meet the setback that's what the encroachment agreement would state um, if you do look at this though the topography this is kind of a ridge here um, and this goes you know into forest service back in here uh, most of the access, this is Lawrence County right here. Most of the access to these back properties are either off Rochford Road or through Lawrence County. Um, the access to this back parcel is actually in Lawrence County through here. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Lester. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, did they purchase it like this or did they build it like that? I mean, in general, I don't have a problem with that. I was just wondering if maybe they purchased the property with it already being built there. Yes, Livingston's did purchase it from the previous owner. The previous owner was the one that submitted the building permit application that showed that the setback was being met. Okay. Mr. Sorry, go ahead. Mr. Yes. Chair, so if we could look further south, that's where the sugar shack is, right? Yes, the sugar shack is actually right here. Uh, is that the sugar shack? Um, yes, yeah, this is right here. This is the property to the rear. This is um, 
um, where the chair is right here. The, these lines are off quite a okay. bit. Okay. There's a home here, there's a small ADU, and then there's a shop building here. Um, they are looking to subdivide this and sure. basically along this portion and sell this portion to the Sugar Shack to utilize for overflow parking um, because they did lose quite a bit of their parking in the front because of the 385 um, expansion. Um, so they're looking to purchase this portion of it um, and maintain this drainage area and then use this, um, utilize this for overflow parking. So I'm that's gonna, kind of why all of this is coming about. Go ahead and make the motion, move to approve COVA 24-0010 with the following two conditions. Number one, that the variance applies only to the 40 by 80 shop building. All other structures must maintain proper setbacks or the original separate variances. And number two is that an encroachment agreement is approved by the Board of Commissioners for the portion of the structure encroaching onto the section line prior to filing the mylar at the registered deeds office. Second. Motion was made by Ross Connect, seconded by Hadcock. Discussion, Deb, did you still have? No, I was just gonna make a motion. Okay. okay. So we have a motion and a second. Mr. Chair. Mr. Drews. So my understanding, the encroachment agreement still has to be drafted and come back to this commission, or? Correct. Okay. Correct. In order for the encroachment agreement to be drafted, um, this variance needed to be uh, okay. approved. So once the variance is approved, if the encroachment agreement isn't approved, then obviously this variance right. is okay. not. So. Okay. Motion is for approval and seconded. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The next item is variant COVA 24-0011 for Reynolds and Livingston. Chris Livingston in all aspects is the agent is to reduce a setback to a section line for an existing structure that is zero foot from the section line right away in a highway service district. Um, if you look here, this is a existing accessory dwelling unit with a attached deck. Um, you can see that the setback is zero feet here from the section line right of way. Uh, this is the same property as the previous um, staff is recommending denial as there's no special conditions on the property that would excuse little and literal enforcement of PCZO section 204. However, if the Board of Adjustment disagrees and approves the request, staff recommends one condition be included. And again, this was constructed um, with a previous owner. Um, the original building permit did show that the setbacks could be met. Um, this is an accessory dwelling unit. Um, so in order for this to be approved for a conditional use permit in front of the Planning Commission at a later date, it'll be at the end of this month, this variance would have to be um, approved or we wouldn't be able to approve the CUP or they would have to remove um, the deck portion of that. Again, this was constructed prior um, with a build. There was a building permit submitted. It just showed that the um, structure was meeting the setbacks. Chair. Ms. Hadcock. I'm going to move approval with one condition that the variance applies only to the existing accessory dwelling unit and attached decks. All other structures must maintain the proper setbacks or obtain separate variances. Second. Moved by Hadcock, seconded by Roskinect. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, I'm just waiting for this to come up. Again, this is the same property again. Um, this is subdivision regulations variance COSV 24-0006 is to waive the requirement to dedicate a 40-foot access easement for an existing driveway. Um, so this is necessary because they are looking to subdivide this lot. Um, this will be lot um, 1A or 1B and 1A. Um, this access easement is actually, most of it is in Lawrence County. Um, there's just this small portion of it right here that it's in Pennington County. Um, it's used to access this lot right now. It's it's a driveway. Um, you can see it here. Here's the chair. Um, here's the building that used to be the Trout Haven. It's a, um, <coughs> oh, sorry. It was the, yes, the pizza. Um, but this is the structure back here. Um, but most of this is in Lawrence County. Um, the only item of concern, and it'll come up um, in the rezone, is that there's this small portion of it. Um, this portion of it will be accessing highway service. 
Um, and I have spoken with the owner of the Sugar Shack and they are aware if they use this portion for anything um, but parking, um, they would have to improve Question. this access. Um, but as of right now, it's just a driveway to access this portion of it. So they're ask, asking Fish. to waive it. Um, staff is recommending denial as there are no special conditions on the property that would excuse literal enforcement. Um, however, if the Board of Adjustment disagrees and approves the request, we do not recommend any conditions um, be included. Um, currently, it's just being used as a driveway. Go to the board. Any questions from the board? Here. Ms. Hancock. I'll move approval with no conditions of the subdivision regulation variance. And you need a reason? This is a great idea. Um, because um, based on topography and conditions, um, for me, for the Ordinance 14 standards, I think this property's been around for a while. So. Okay. Motion made I'll by second Hack, the motion. And seconded Chair. by Rosconnect. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Cody. Uh, Cody Sack, Environmental Planner. Uh, item 13D is appeal of variance application uh, for Reno Gulch. Uh, this was continued from the last Board of Commissioners meeting. Uh, just to recap, staff is denying or denied the application based on there is no hardship or physical hardship. The applicant hired an engineer. Uh, the engineer did a report, submitted that report to our office that shows that water detention is should be required on the property and is needed and that there is room on the property to put the detention pond. Uh, Mr. Raines is here. I will let him speak. And if uh, the board has any questions, I will be ready to answer those. Thank you, Cody. Mr. Raines, we continued this on because there was such a back noise when you were trying to zoom in, we couldn't. Yeah, I guess your people said that uh, part of it was on our side and part of it was on your side, but it's pretty good now. So okay, <laughs> appreciate you, you have the floor, us. Mr. Raines. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I've got an outline I'm going to go through just to try to get through it as quick as I can. Uh, but I did want to address what Cody said. Our engineers did not present that just out of the blue. They presented that because we were told we had to. So our engineers have never seen retro design or detention ever in the years they've been working. So I spoke with them the other day, <clears throat> and they verified that. Uh, we asked them to do it based on what the county had told us to do. The, the submittal before that did not have a detention pond on it. Sorry, I'm losing my voice here a little bit. I don't know if this is allowed, but <laughs> this was the first submittal, I believe, that we had with no detention pond on it. So I may get out of line here a little bit. <clears throat> we were told in the past that we may have to provide detention. Uh, the staff somewhere had alerted us to that maybe a change or a you know change in interpretation or whatever we didn't see anything in the codes that provided for that but we didn't mind providing detention going forward but we had no idea that they would want us to provide it for the whole site going back 30 years so after hearing that last meeting i did call the two last owners which went back approximately 30 years and there's never been detention required on the property, as you can see, if you can put up Google uh, Earth map or whatever, you can see there's never been any. This is through multiple considerations, through multiple buildings, through multiple passings of them. Uh, and we just heard after we bought the property, I think it's going on three years now, <clears throat> I believe the detention may be required, which we don't, we don't mind doing that. We build in other areas and detention is a normal real life, but I've never seen in 40 years, or approximately 40 years I've been doing this, uh, do it retroactively. I think that would create a, I think it would be impossible to do that across barriers and the way it's written is 15 to 18% or whatever it is of the property. So if you had somebody that had 100 acres or 1,000 acres, in essence, if they built little chips off of it, they'd never have to provide detention. When the essence of the EPA spirit of the, the what they're trying to achieve there is going forward, if you, in our, as our engineer stated, disturbed, disrupted area is what typically is taken into consideration going forward. So we, in essence, feel this would be a punishment for doing things the way the county had told the last two owners plus ourselves to do it in the past. 
which also makes it a lot more difficult because to not master plan detention into a site makes it even harder. And it's one of the things that our engineer, which we're very familiar with, and my son, I guess, was trying to do this to figure out how much detention we would need going forward in the future and provide a pond big enough, and that's what he asked the engineer to do based on what was told to him that we would have to provide it for the whole pre-existing site. And when I saw that and the cost overruns with and the disrupted uh, areas and this and that, even getting into rock over in that corner because it all that's where the low part of the property is. So that, that's, that's not, our engineers just to say, didn't just come up with this. It wasn't a new engineering um, event. I mean, could you imagine if the, the counties and municipalities around the country are generally held to somewhat of the same standard as builders are? And could you imagine having to go back and provide detention for pre-existing roads? Uh, so at some point in time, you can't erase the past, whether some feel it's a mistake or not. You have to drive up a peg and, and go forward, and we certainly don't mind that. <clears throat> Let me try to get through some of this stuff here. So just for clarification as you're reading that, you're suggesting that you went to your engineering for a retention pond because you knew what you were going to build for, that's what you were going to do a retention pond for, and then you didn't realize you have to do it. It goes retroactive for all the other, the whole property. Yeah. The, okay. If you stayed under 10,000 square feet, which I honestly didn't understand because it's accumulative. So typically when something has changed, you know, it's going forward. But then when I learned they're wanting to do it retroactively for the whole site, whatever the new buildings we're going to be putting in, we said, well, yeah, we don't mind doing detention for the new buildings, but we bought the property based upon the understanding that these had been taken into consideration in the past, approved in the past, and uh, engineered and everything that the county had required in the past. We bought it with that, uh, and I've, I, honestly, I've never seen that anywhere else. I don't know. Eventually, it would become an issue, I would think. But I did go back and look at the wording of it, and quite honestly, I think there is a problem in the wording, and I think that's probably why over the last 30 years, there, you know, somebody finally sees this and says, hey, we got to do something because these people aren't putting detention. Although detention out here, we've never had an issue with it. I went out to the site the other day, and I've got some photos of it. There's really no runoff that makes it the creek. These are clean roofs and gravel, just like the Mickelson Trail gravel that actually acts as a filtration into the systems. Around the world in different places, they actually use roof water and cisterns and things like that to provide water for communities. So there's nothing I could see runoff anywhere around any of the buildings. And we've had detention ponds with water features in them uh, for 20 plus years. We've never had to clean. There's no noticeable measurement of of it there just because cell storage by nature are very, very clean sites. Uh, some people use barn buildings and stuff to create cisterns to water their gardens with and whatever like that. <clears throat> but I do, I do think if the county wants to take this, this position or posture or change or whatever it might be deemed, that the wording of that really needs to be looked at because someone with a thousand acres should be accountable to the same standards as somebody with if you're disrupting, you know, whatever you guys come up with is a decision of how many, in, in some areas it's like a half acre, but then you get different lots that are subdivided, and if they're under half acre, then you've negated the point. But the real point is to stop mass flow into the systems. So I would highly recommend if going forward to go back and look at that verbiage and say for new disrupted service or land that you allow for that going forward, and that's what our engineers said that they they uh, typically do. And then typically it's easier if you do have to do it, whatever you have to do when you're master planning a site to provide the tension up front for it because it's a lot cheaper when you've got a, equipment out there master planning into everything. Going back and trying to retroactively uh, put detention for time periods when it wasn't meant for or designed for or, or maybe of concern is very difficult. Um, I had heard it say we're right on the creek. <clears throat> I don't know if you got any pictures of, as you can pull up of uh, Google Earth, whatever. But we're actually about a football field away from the Spring Creek. There's a dry tributary that goes around the side of our property, which is dry right now. I took pictures of it. And it feeds the renal gulch that comes up from behind there. So I'd say it could probably use some water, <laughs> honestly. Just in your opening sorry. Oh, 
Okay. I, <clears throat> sir? You got follow-up? Yeah, I'm just going through my list here. Okay. I heard something uh, said about 15 or 18 years ago, there may have been something changed. Uh, if that's so, then it, it's not really been taken into consideration over those last 15 or 18 years. Uh, if the county felt it was a, a strong enough reason to change the verbiage in the, the codes, then I, it doesn't make sense and they wouldn't have paid any attention to it over the last 15, 18 years after they change it. But I think there is a problem in the wording of it. <clears throat> the code says construction or development, and we're not doing any construction or development on the, those sites back there. It's the disrupted area that we're dealing with. And also in the codes, it talks about if you have non-conforming buildings, that those buildings will be allowed to go forward you know, without changing them if you don't change that status. And we're not changing any usage on our, on our land here. We're, it's the same self-storage commercial use. We're not asking for a change in, in usage. This I got out of order with and talked about before. <laughs> well, I just want to be clear. This is Mr. Rains. What, what's on our agenda is to uh, either deny or accept uh, the Board of Adjustments appeal for Reno Gold Self Storage. Uh, and then if it's accepted, we direct the planning staff to accept the variance, and then you'd still have to come back. Am I correct? It, to do it, so we accepted a, him to apply for a variance. That's not saying it's approved. It's saying he'd have to come back with his engineers and so forth and go through the process again. So I just wanted to clarify what's on our agenda for you. It's not approval uh, of accepting it. It's just whether we accept the, the application or not. Yeah, and I'm looking at the past history of this and whatever else I've been able to find. I've talked to some other builders in the area. We're doing a uh, investing in a project up in Spearfish, and I talked to the builder of that, the Stencil Group, and I've never seen anybody go back retroactively. So I don't know. You might want to think about consideration of that. Is it really a variance, or is it a changing in interpretation? Uh, I do think looking at the verbiage on that going forward would be helpful to everyone. And, involved in it so we'll do whatever we have to and we're not saying we don't want to do our part uh, but I just wanted to clarify those points here yeah. Ms. Head, Mr. Rains I was at the Planning Commission when they denied this and they denied <coughs> it based on your information from your um, engineer and then the new update is that it's disturbed 26 percent so that's a pretty huge amount you also, in the past, stayed under the code, which is under 10,000 feet of disturbance. So that's how, at that part in that time, or the guy that owned it before, how that was done. And it wasn't grandfathered in for that. It actually was the code. So it was doing the right thing by then, and they just made sure they stayed under the 10,000 feet so they wouldn't have to go and do the holding pond. At this point, your engineer is saying, so is the staff, and this is why the planning department um, said that you needed to do this was based not only on staff recommendation, it was based on your engineer and his report. And you are grandfathered in until you change the use. You're changing the use, meaning you are disturbing more ground. If I build something on a house or I build more stuff on my property, it's not grandfathered in. It doesn't matter if it's 10,000 feet disturbance or more, or if it's adding a deck or something else on my building. So on those rules they have been around for a long time and we've never had a problem with it here on disturbance <coughs> or holding ponds because of that reason and that that rule has worked on everything we've done from construction to <coughs> otherwise and the county does follow that rule as well um, and I've been around here for a while to know that um, I feel bad about that you have to do a holding pond it costs you more money but those recommendations were off your engineer Working with our no, staff. No, ma'am, they weren't. Okay, they, they were weren't. because I saw the paper and then that. that so that let, me finish. let me finish. Let me finish. Is forcing. Uh, we don't force anybody. We follow rules and regulations, so that wasn't a force. Once you went over 10,000 feet of disturbance, then you had to follow a different rule. So that's not force, that's a rule. The county didn't do anything. <coughs> you went over the 10,000 disturbance, if I'm correct, Cody. Correct. And once he went over that and added these other properties to it, you were past where 
you should be for disturbance, also that you needed a holding pond. The holding this, pond is also, sir, if I may for, to that. hold on a sec, it's also for because you're by a creek. So we are trying to protect those areas <coughs> by the creek. And you also were grandfathered in on your, on your, um, in your back part that's by the creek because it was grandfathered, but then you kept building. So Cody, you can come back up here if you want. Uh, Mr. Raines is gonna answer and then maybe we could tell um, we were at not, the Planning Commission and then the facts on this, thank you. We weren't disturbing over 10,000 feet. The buildings that were there were not disturbed. There's no complaints about those. There's no uh, problems with those. They were existing fine under the way that they were passed before. Okay, sir, so, so let, I'm not trying to interrupt you, but let Cody, uh, so you have an understanding of the code? I have an understanding if, of the code, ma'am. Sir, I'll, from I'll what I've seen, it. What I've seen, you have said the staff need to change their code, and the staff did this, and the staff did that. They didn't do anything. They came on your property. You showed them what they needed to do, and now they're, they're going to let them explain what the issues are, and then you come back and say, okay, we, we well, didn't do that. Well, I can respond first. And, and he, Cody has, has been kind enough to, to explain in a letter, and I, I understand. Okay. And I also understand that some of the staff has told us that this change was coming and that that hasn't been adhered to over the last 30 years. So, and we did not disturb, we're not looking to disturb 10,000 square feet. That area is not disturbed. That has been accounted for in the past. So our disturbance would not be over 10,000 square feet. Okay, so let them explain because they worked with your engineers, sir, so. No, they, we worked with our engineers and our engineers did that based upon what we told them. Yes. Did you work directly with our engineers? Uh, Cody Stack, environmental <laughs> planner, I did speak with your engineer. Um, several occasions uh, about this. Um, so to answer the question, there keeps coming up the 10,000 square feet and the 15% impervious area. They are not one and the same. You don't have to go over 10,000 square feet to be over 15% impervious area. Um, so for instance, I know in an email I explained, if you have a one acre lot and you have a 6,500 square feet of disturbance, you're not over 10,000 square feet where you would need the stormwater permit, but you're still over the 15% impervious area where you have to do the water quality capture volume. You have to show the en engineering for drainage and everything. And, and that's what we're discussing today. We're over the 15% currently. And how long has this rule been in code? Since at least 2010. Okay, thank you. Um, and then to, to go on to, uh, there keeps being a talk, you're, the engineering report, like currently you're 27%, the engineering report shows that you're going to be at 80%, 20, um, without doing math uh, on top of my head, that's 53% difference, I believe. So there's going to be a 53% impervious area increase. And to not say that you can't retroactively do detention, would be counterproductive to say that you only have to negate 27% to do a pond, that 20%, 27% still has to go somewhere. So if you have an undersized pond, that pond's not functioning the way it's supposed to be. <coughs> so to say that we don't retroactively have to do this why? is incorrect. And why haven't they had to do it in the past? I, I, can't, I can't speak to why building permits were approved in the past. Um, the way things work generally is if, if something's missed in our ordinance and it's on the planning staff, it, it, it's almost legal nonconforming. You don't touch the property, we don't say anything, but when you're trying to increase that, you're going to have to come into compliance. So I, I can't speak to why 10 years ago the director at the time didn't require anything, right. um, but to, to allow a pond to say half the size that that other half of that water still has to go somewhere and, and the water the goes somewhere um it's going to go by the creek and it's not going to stay on your property and that's why they say if that's why they make you do these reports sir is because you're going to be um, disturbing somebody else's property by your drainage you also are on a and this is the land that goes from drop off into your area, which goes in the back of a creek in the back of it. So it's, it's a huge area um, to not have a holding pond holding the water that they're talking about and having all that impervious area. So you're actually increasing that. And I believe in business, sir, but I also, um, we don't do this just, just to you. We've done that to many people in the, in the county that added to their properties or cause, or we're gonna cause any drainage issues for anybody else. So it's not just yours. Well, it's, it's not been done that way 
over the past 30 years, and it wasn't done that way two years ago when we added those last two buildings. It was brought up to our attention that they were going to be looking at it differently. But to do something retroactively, I've never heard of that. And our engineers do not take into consider the whole property. Typically, they do it going forward. When you're building going forward, typically it doesn't go backwards. And the property has been draining just fine without any complaints, without any problems. I could see no signs of sediment runoff or anything around the property when I walked it yesterday. Okay, and I apologize. And our sediment from a self-storage facility is, is, is minimal to begin with. They're, they're really pretty environmental friendly. But this wasn't done because our engineers came over. We asked our engineers to do this based upon what the county had told us, which they didn't do two years ago. They didn't do five years ago. They didn't do 10 years ago. They didn't do 20 years ago. They didn't do 30 years ago. So to me, I don't, it doesn't make sense. So Jason, can you come up here for a second and tell me, <coughs> I know you had visited with me about this property. How come he didn't have to do it before? Because he keeps saying the last two years, the last three years, um, what was the difference between now and then? Uh, yeah, like Cody said, I can't speak to what was approved prior to you. Um, I do know when I did the conditional use permit amendment last year, I did speak to the applicant's son about this, and I told him they, this was noted during my review, and this is coming. Like, you're going to have to do stormwater detention moving forward. So it, it was clearly understood at that point. So they understood that it was going to move forward the minute they started doing other properties and stuff, and that when it came to pass this year that you duly said and told them that there was going to be changes on how the right. stormwater. Right, and I included it as a condition of approval. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and we, we understood that going forward. Okay. But going forward, yes, we, Cody did explain going that. Forward. We understood that, or uh, Jason. Mr. Chair. Mr. Laster. I have a question for you, um, sir. If if we if we give a variance and let you do this smaller retaining pond, and I'm just I'm just spitballing here. <coughs> if we allow you to do it via your engineer's report, the smaller one, and it fails, who are you going to blame? Well, I've been doing ditch ponds for forty years, and I've never had one fail that was correctly engineered. The engineers take into consideration what's going into the pond. They don't shunt the whole property into that area. They just put, shut the new buildings into it going forward, as my engineer said. Mr. Chair, do you concur that with all the impervious ground out there, that that is going to impact the amount of water and how it flows and where it goes? It's not. The net increase on it is, is just for the new buildings that we're adding. So the net increase, it's functioning fine now. There's no problems. We have had no complaints. I see no sediment. So the net increase of the new buildings is what typically is taken into consideration. So it would increase the, as per the impervious surfaces. Then the water quality, as Cody spoke about, is a, is a different thing. But all that is, is taken into consideration going forward with the new buildings. The, the, func the system is there has functioned fine for years. So now to go back and fix something that wasn't broke, that was pre-approved by the county and engineers in the past, I've never seen before. Okay. We do, so the request is to appeal the, the Board of Adjust, is it appeal to the Rideau Gold Self Storage to be able to accept the uh, variance application? Is there any more questions from the commission for Mr. Raines? Mr. Chair, not really a question, but I've been trying to work with Darren. I'm familiar with the property, you know, I, Ralph and Sandy Cruz, started it and they built some buildings and rot Weller or whatever he bought it from them and added more buildings and and uh, it's my understanding that those buildings have permits and there is never there <clears throat> there is never this issue with detention ponds when they uh, built those buildings and permits on file and now Darren owns it and he wants to build another building and they're saying you got to go back and so my compromise would be I don't think he's I wouldn't I don't really feel that he needs to go back and and uh, cover those previous buildings because it was never addressed by the county. But going forward on any construction, I would highly recommend that he follow uh, uh, procedures. That's kind of my take. It's kind of a compromise, you might say. Any further comment? Chair. Do you, Mr. Range, do you have a final comment before I go to the board for a motion? No, I other than just we don't we don't mind doing going forward is is typical. I don't know of anything from the EPA, and I think I asked that question. If there's anything that they're saying 
that requires retroactive detention. I've never heard of it. I've never seen it. Uh, it goes in the spirit against the spirit of what they're trying to achieve. They're trying to, to do better going forward. The, there's no way you can go back and undo the sins of the past, if you will. You just can't. You just can't. And it, it creates also a situation the way that it's worded. Somebody with a thousand acres would never have to do detention because they're under the 15% for the water quality. It may not be, even if they stay under the detention, there's still the water quality, 15, 18%, whatever it is. And we put in water quality features, you know, we're very familiar with the difference in them, the different requirements, et cetera. But I've just never heard of it. And uh, perhaps someone should get hold of the EPA and, and speak with them about it because they're the ones I think that applied pressure on the county. Okay, Ms. Hancock. Chair, if you look at all the drainage areas in Rapid Valley and what we had to move forward with because people did not do it in the past and we just kept letting them do it because they believed at this point they haven't done it for 10 to 50 years, but they should now. But then they want to do more development. They want to do more stuff to their properties. You're not the only one that has to do this. So I'm going to say my motion today is to deny. Second. I have a motion on the floor to deny the Board of Adjustment appeal for Reno Gulch self-storage for Darren Rains. And second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. aye. Motion carries with three eyes. Oh. But it failed. Okay. Or you've been denied. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. So I'd look for a motion to adjourn from the Board of Adjustments. So moved. Moved by Lassiter. Second. Second by Hadcock. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Morning, Commissioners. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Commissioners. Jason Thennison, Assistant Planning Director. Agenda item 14A is Vacation of Platte, COVPL 24-0006, to vacate four existing easements along former lot lines on the subject property. The applicant and landowner is Morris Reiner, Reinerheim LLC. Location of the property is 155 Falcon Lane. It is 2.08 acres, currently zoned suburban residential district. No special flood hazard area on the property. Uh, the request was sent out for an interdepartmental review. There were no objections or concerns received. Staff's analysis of the request is that the applicant is requesting to vacate three existing 10-foot drainage and utility easements, as well as one private access and utility easement that remained <clears throat> after lot lines were relocated under a lot line adjustment plat that was approved by the board March 7th, 2023. Uh, you can see here on the screen these are the former lot lines identified in red. He has since vacated those. Uh, this is the Exhibit A that will be filed with the Register of Deeds showing the easements uh, that remained that would be vacated under this action. Um, this is currently what the lot looks like now without those uh, pre-existing lot lines. Uh, staff, staff has received no public comments or objections to this request. Uh, the applicants have provided all the information required by South Dakota state law. And with that, <clears throat> excuse me, staff recommends approval of vacation of Platt CO VPL 24-0006. Is there any questions for Jason? Oh, Chair. Ms. Hadcock. Move approval with one condition. <clears throat> second. Moved by Hadcock, seconded by Lassiter. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Motion carries. On these next three, should, would you like to take them all three up but then vote on them separately? I would recommend that. The Planning Commission did, and it, I think it was a simpler. So I'd look for a motion to suspend the rules and take up, listen to all three B, C, and D presentations, but vote on the items separately. So moved. Sorry, thank you. Moved by Hancock, seconded by Drews. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. This is preliminary plan PPL 24-0010 to subdivide and create lot 1A and lot 1B of Boyle subdivision. The applicant is Reynolds and Livingston, LLC. The surveyor is All Aspects, Brad Limbo. 
The property is located at 22491 Highway 385. It's approximately 4.27 acres, and there is a portion of this property that is in Lawrence County. Uh, Lawrence County has already approved their portion of the plat. Um, the access to this property is off of Highway 385. If you look at this, um, they're looking at subdividing this property to give this portion of the property um, to the Sugar Shack, because the Sugar Shack is going to use this portion of the property, and they are going to maintain this property as Highway Service District. Currently, this whole property is um, zoned Highway Service District, so they're looking to keep the zoning of Highway Service District for this. Um, the Sugar Shack is going to use this as overflow parking and for area for storage um, because they did lose um, quite a bit of their um, parking and front access um, with the Highway 385 expansion. So they're looking to purchase this portion, this acre or so. Um, this portion right now currently is zoned Highway Service and was used as a recreational resort. There was some... Um, RV sites and uh, vacation rental here. There's a large shop building in another home. Um, they're looking at um, rezoning this to a rural residential district. They are going to, they do have an application in for the planning commission to hear um, a, a request for a conditional use permit for this ADU. Um, and it does meet the requirements of the ADU, the sizing. Um, and then with the access that you had heard here. So with this preliminary plan, they're looking at creating these two lots. And then the next two is to um, change the comprehensive plan um, because this currently is highway service, I believe. Oops. Oh, yes, it's um, suburban residential. And this is actually rural residential. So it's looking at changing the comprehensive plan to maintain this as highway service because this portion right here um, will be part of the Sugar Shack, which is right here. Um, and then this back here is going to be a rural residential. Um, it doesn't need a comp plan amendment because it is suburban residential, so that's a higher density. Um, that comprehensive plan amendment is just for this portion right here um, for the Highway Service District. It does have some frontage up in Lawrence County on the line, but it is going to be used as commercial for the Sugar Shack. Um, so with that, staff is recommending approval of the preliminary plan and the rezone and the comprehensive plan. Any questions for Brittany? This is cleaning up this area quite a bit um, and using it. I do know that the rear portion of the property, both properties were for sale and are under contract um, pending um, these changes and these requests. Um, so they're cleaning up the property with that sale. Thanks, Sorry. Thanks Brittany. Chair. Mm -hmm. Ms. Hadcock. So on 14B, which would be the preliminary plan, I recommend approval with the 13 conditions. Second. Moved by Hadcock, seconded by Lassiter to approve COPPL 24-0010 with 13 conditions. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, and to keep us saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Ms. Hadcock. Chair, the second one would be the public hearing of the comprehensive plan amendment. Um, I recommend approval of the comprehensive plan amendment C0, COCA 24-0008. Moved by Hadcock. Second. Second by Lassiter. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor and to keep by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Sir, the last one, Planning Commission recommendation. Also, what I recommend for the board is approval of the rezone C-O-R-Z 24-0007. Second. Moved by Hadcock, second by Lassiter. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, and to keep us saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany, Jason, and your staff. Next, that brings us up to items from chair or commission members. Is there any items before we go to meeting and committee reports? Seeing none, I go to committee reports, item 16, which is go to Mr. Laster. Uh, complete health care. I had a conflict with two meetings at the same time. So I was unable to go to the health center board. Um, I was at the building committee meeting. Um, that one was going to be canceled. Uh, and then after the fire and wall um, and needing to have a discussion about what transpired out in wall at the highway department, we did, we did 
actually have that meeting and the bulk of that conversation was dealing with uh, the wall highway department damage and how to move forward with that and discussions for the for the funds and we already heard all that today so i don't have to rehash any of that thank you travis next we have mr drews okay uh so on august 22nd had the uh, transportation executive policy committee meeting uh, major street plan analysis on conceptual roadway alignments and profiles for the 40 arterial and collector roads anticipated to be developed and constructed within the next 20 year planning horizon for Rapid City was adopted. Also the next four year uh, transportation improvement program which includes Pennington County was given final approval. Uh, previously there was a separate citizens committee to review and receive input on transportation policy. However, in recent years, it was difficult for them to establish a quorum for those citizen members. And so the technical and citizens committee have now been combined. Citizen input will continue to have the opportunity to present concerns or comments to the new committee structure. And I will uh, forego on the WIR. I know that Lloyd will be covering that. Uh, just a reminder that the everybody is invited to the uh, West Dakota Regional Water System annual meeting uh, to be held Thursday. Uh, I believe that's at the box. Yeah. Yes, it is. Starts like at nine in the morning. And if you're planning on going, just uh, make Joan aware of it. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Torres. Next to go to Ron Ross Connect. Mr. Chair, I only have, uh, I'll expand just a little bit on the building committee. We did uh, follow up. We uh, went to City Hall and we met with their, their planning department uh, and our, uh, I, I got a copy of the agenda. So one, of, one was the 900 concourse property. Uh, there's some landscaping points that we don't know. Uh, just want to make sure that we need to know what we need relative to the points. Uh, for that light industrial building, the uh, discussion was around 35 trees. We really need 35 trees, and if you have the trees, then you got to have the irrigation. So there might we might be asking for a variance in that. And I think if I understand it right, we actually have to go in front of the city council uh, building committee or commissioners, and uh, we're going to have to be there to answer questions when that happens. Also, there was the uh, request for a sidewalk variance. I thought that would be a no-brainer, but there again, it seems like, you know, uh, the final say is the city planning commission. They make a recommendation to the uh, city council, and that sidewalk could be very, very expensive. It, uh, it would go along the, uh, uh, the boundary uh, facing concourse, and there's some drainage that would have to be uh, and the thing, thing about it is, the sidewalk goes nowhere. Uh, it ends, at both ends, it, it doesn't go anywhere. So there again, uh, Vicki said, you know, you're, we're probably going to have to go in front of the city council and the planning commission will make a recommendation and they will have the final say. Uh, then we discussed the two-hour parking, evidently uh, Kansas City Street. Uh, the... Parking can be pretty hard for uh, folks that have to uh, be witnesses in court services. And it was asked if we could get rid of the two hour parking. Well, that got a very cold reception. And so I think there might be a compromise. A compromise would be they could, if I understand that, Travis, there could be some passes to the jurors that would. Uh, allow them free parking it, it sounded pretty complex but it, it was pretty complex because they the suggestion was that uh the court pay for those passes for at a month at a time and and sheriff was like the court's not going to pay for those passes right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so i don't think we got anywhere on that one and then uh, relative to the jail project we were talking about vacating first street from st joe in kansas city uh not like in the near future, but down the road, uh, instead of making that a, a through corridor, nothing would be built on it, but they just felt that uh, with the, all our adjacent properties that vacating that might be an option for uh, better uh, 
traffic for the county itself. Is, is that about right, Travis? For covered parking, so they can have ready yeah. vehicles ready to roll. And then the sally port for the jail, which would probably extend out into St. Joe, but it wouldn't be any further than the current courthouse steps, if I recall. Uh, there is some discussion on that because uh, that just uh, kind of aligns with the plan, the current plans for the uh, jail expansion. So those were the things that were discussed. And that being said, we're probably going to, somebody's going to have to attend some city council meetings rel relative to the uh, vacation or variance for the sidewalk and landscaping for the 900 concourse. Thanks, Ron. Deb? So my uh, health care trust board, my lady was gone, so I was working the desk that Wednesday and Thursday. Um, tr uh, Janice went on vacation. Um, just missed that. Penny's County Housing Redevelopment, we did a rad <coughs> conversion update in our new structure from the beginning to the end, the goals, how much it would cost, that kind of thing. Uh, our CEO, which is Brian Ockbach, did a great explanation on that, lined it all out for us. It was pretty amazing. Um, I asked as a chair if he would update us because things change, and he did a very good job. We also are changing our meetings, Ron, so hope, hopefully you know this, to Wednesdays, the same date, but we'll have our meetings at 1130. They'll serve us lunch, and then we'll start a meeting at 12. So the date has changed from the housing authority during the day because a lot of times people were had other meetings or other things. Um, in Ron's case, and others had to drive a long ways in in the dark at night in the winter. So um, it worked good for the staff, and it also worked good for um, the uh, board. So the, we did make that motion. So. Thank you. Very good meeting. Um, I did not attend the complete health center board meeting because I got caught up at work. Um, attended the planning commission. We dealt with some of the stuff on the planning commission. Uh, so I don't really need to go over that. Um, the NACO WIR site visit, that was a quick uh, visit in. They came in on a Monday and they toured the motels and did some travel time. And uh, they also went down to Monument, looked at the facilities down there to see what, what's all available. And uh, we, uh, I was finally able to hook up with them on the following day, me and Mr. Drews at one of the possible reception sites, which, which would be Crazy Horse. So we uh, took them up there and they actually ate a meal and got to go to up to the monument. So that was a very exciting moment for that, that group. Uh, then they, we followed up with them the next morning and things are looking real positive. Uh, they've got uh, sponsors that they also include in there. So that'll be part of it. And we do have Zeke who's planning coming back uh, next is it next week, in two weeks, for our South Dakota Association of County Officials and Commissioners Conference, and he's gonna present during that time, but he, he's also gonna uh, hook up with Mr. Drews and I think some others to go up and see uh, the wharf mine cut and uh, the lab, because that's one thing that the, the conference is, is interested in, so they're gonna go take a look at that. But they're moving forward with uh, bringing the conference here and things are looking good. Communications are going. Uh, with that, I also attended, I was only able to make it to the fair twice this year once uh, and serve some meals. And, and I could tell that the board members were very hard at work because I was seeing the emails and texts coming forward that uh, they had a lot of stuff going on and they really stepped up and, and took care of the fair. I also attended the Ignite Open House. And uh, quite frankly, that was very enlightening. I think uh, I talked to uh, one person who was in the program and another person off to the side who, who uh, volunteers in our drug court and other stuff that the county has going on and helps uh, individuals uh, get work 
and and helps them out quite a bit. He he works for a business in town and helps get them in. And he was uh, he was very enlightening. He said he went through one of the programs and it saved his life. And it was, you know, uh, I, it was a good conversation. So I'm glad I attended it. And uh, I think uh, I talked to Tony for a while too, but it, it looks like it's going to be a good program. So with that, that's all I've got. We have no executive session, so I'd look for a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Moved by Lasseter, seconded by Hancock. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries.